Looks like it's 8 p.m. How are we all doing? Um, it looks like people are rocking up. I was unsure whether the uh, the hype of the first live stream had uh, had faded out, and uh, and people had hit the point where um, they weren't that interested <laughs> anymore. But there's still like 17 people in here now, so there are there are some people here. Um, today, rough plan of things that I wanted to talk about is um, stuff I've been putting together, ideas I've been putting together about computer graphics and how I'm going to put a course together. So I thought people might be interested in um, in, in what it's like to, um, to structure a, a university course. And I, I, I don't know if anyone else does it this way, um, but I thought it might be interested. <laughs> Hamish was like, I'm just here to see you play games. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think we're going to talk about the developing this course for the whole, the whole like two hours or anything. I may get bored of that as well, <laughs> but I made slides uh, they're not, they're not actually, um, full on slides. They're not like my normal, like my comp 1511 slides, they've, they've got more time and effort put into them. This was like a couple of hours on Friday, I put these slides together. But one thing that's been quite funny to me is like, um, this Monday stream is like one of the things that actually gets me to do work. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever done this kind of thing where you, you work on a project or something like that and you have like weekly meetings with your, um, uh, with a supervisor or with your team or something like that. And the only reason you do any work is that you have to show something in the weekly meeting or else you're just kind of like, um, you, you, you just haven't done anything that week if you don't have anything to show in the weekly meeting. I remember like I, I heard a, a joke from one of the, the people on my SunSwift team that uh, they got they got big kudos for this thing they did for the project, which was really pushing the SunSwift project forward. And they told me later, it's like I literally pulled that together in like two hours before the meeting because I was panicking that I had to show something. <laughs> and I was like, yes, okay, yes, it felt like to you two hours, but I'm pretty sure that that person had been thinking about how to do that for at least a month or something, and they didn't realize that the the actual coding of the demo to show how it would work was actually the culmination of a great deal of thinking, and it's not something they could have done in two hours if I had just sort of dropped the project on their lap in two hours. But I think this um, this stream today, so Friday, I did some work on on, on the, the framework for graphics and it's all in these slides. This actually like this stream is actually helping me a lot for, um, for work. So that's one of the reasons why I, um, you know, like the, I had the monetization on last week for YouTube and I thought, oh, that's exciting. Um, I made 60 cents and, and then I thought, I thought, this is not worth it. This is not really what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to be okay with semi attaching this to my job and it being a part of my work to do this because it's actually quite useful for my work to have this weekly thing where I have to, I have to deliver something. So I said, screw that. Um, I don't need, <laughs> I don't need to make tiny, tiny amounts of money from my students who are already technically paying my full-time salary in a sense, like your, 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 your it kind of like, and so instead what I'm going to do is like sort of treat this like, okay, I'm meeting my clients once a week. Sometimes I'm meeting my clients and reporting on work that I'm doing, but sometimes I'm meeting you just to keep you entertained. <laughs> so it's like we work for like one of those slush companies where I have to, uh, I have to entertain the clients. So I'm not about to take everyone out to a flashy dinner or anything, but I am going to entertain you and these Monday things as much as I can. So there was talk earlier in the chat about um, music and stuff because people have noticed, wait, which way should I roll? This stuff here, not necessarily the ironing board because you have never seen me <laughs> in informal clothing and it's unlikely that you ever will because I don't wear it. But back there next to the shelf, there's a bunch of guitars and stuff. So, um, I have, I've really not touched it that much in the last sort of decade or so, but um, I nearly dropped out of, um, of computing in second year on behalf of music and stuff. I was actually recording an album at the time with, with a few people and um, I've lost that one. I don't even know where that one is. Um, it'll be in a pile of CDs somewhere around the hundreds of CDs I have left over from the 90s and the 2000s before everything went digital. Well, they're digital too, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, 
I, I may be working on some music soon with some friends um, from another uh, uh, music project that I worked on. I was in a band. We were doing a whole lot of, like... It was really hard to explain what we were. We were, like, folk... Folk rock, electronic music, like, we were like a warehouse band. We were doing like warehouse gigs and stuff like that. Were, it was so much fun. It was really cool. And we had this kind of thing happening where the live show I thought was really amazing because um, one of the singers is a um, um, is an artist. And so what she would do is we had a, a camera set up um, over paper where she was sitting at and we'd project that behind us and she was doing live art while we were playing on this like full-on atmospheric music and stuff like that and so i thought that was like heaps and heaps of fun that album still exists actually i'll, I'll show you i'll show you you can you can listen to it actually we can have we can have a background soundtrack for this because i'm not going to get a, a copyright strike for this oh yeah you can see what i've been listening to recently if you... um i've been on a big stray kids thing k-pop and there's twice as well because like they're the same company and I end up like listening to like uh, K-pop of the same company. But the the band was called Asi, but I don't know. It's going to be hard to find it because I think there is another artist called Asi. Hmm. Artists. I know, I know it's on Spotify. Oh, that's weird. I mean, it's not that big a deal. It's just, just like, you know, there's a few hundred people who know who we are and that's it. And it was like years and years ago. I think it's auto completing me to something else. Um, oh, there you go. I put a space after it, and now maybe we're going to get things that only have the word Asi. In them. We had a really interesting setup, actually, because we had um, a guitar player who was singing, a singer, um, myself playing bass and, like, uh, working the electronic music production, and, um, and a tabla player who also had a drum machine going. And so we had this, like, full-on stuff happening, but I can't find it. I used to be able to find it. Wait, maybe... Is it under my liked stuff? No, that's all K-pop. <laughs> Libraries. Albums. Ah, oh, there it is! <laughs> wow, you'll never be able to find it now. But yeah, it's called The Waiting. And if you want to, you can you can listen to this tonight while we're, while we're doing stuff. I'll turn it on here. But... Um, what I might have to do is turn that really low so that you can actually still hear me. Although I haven't got my... Oh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I haven't got my computer audio going through to you at the moment. But, like, you're better off if you want to, like, listening to this yourself. So it's called The Waiting by Asi. But if you go to that artist, there's another artist with that name. And we've all our stuff has been thrown in together. So it didn't really work out but this is an album that we worked on 2008 and stuff uh written all by well, actually it wasn't written all by one person a friend of mine i think it was like two or three people who wrote it um and um they're actually coming back and doing some more music now and so i might be playing on some more stuff i need to like brush off the cobwebs and get back to it and things um anyway yes so there is there is music stuff um I should, um, what I was thinking would be really funny is if I, um, uh, if, if I put together a playlist that we have for the stream, and so it's like, I can't play music because YouTube would be like, this is, this is going to be copyrighted stuff. So instead, what I could do is just go, okay, here's the playlist. Everybody hit play now, <laughs> and then we'll listen to stuff. Um, I think for me, for the moment, I mean, people know... I think people already know who have um, studied Comp 1511 with me that um, uh, I I became a Blink, a Blackpink fan sometime 
around late 2019, early 2020 or something. And it was really funny because there was like a group of people who put their a clan tag on their um on their coco entries for the the first assignment for 2019 comp 1511 they put b pink as it and i was like what's b pink i don't know what that is and then now i've got like t-shirts and stuff like that so i think i think i hopped on the the k-pop trend sometime around then um but i think recently the 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 band the k-pop band that i have really kind of gotten into the most is Stray Kids. Um, it's just really funny because two of the guys from Stray Kids are, are like just dudes from Sydney, which is really kind of, it's really kind of funny that you have people who um, sort of grew up in Sydney, somehow made it through these auditions, uh, went over to Korea, and now they're like some of the biggest stars in the world. I mean, that's that was one of the things that I noticed about Blackpink as well. It was like, I was listening for a little while, and then one of them was just like, full-on Australian accent. I was like, what? What's going on? And then I discovered that Rosé from Blackpink was like, you know, um, born in New Zealand, grew up in Melbourne and stuff. And I was like, what? And, and I just thought that was really cool. I mean, it's not like there aren't other people from Sydney who are like, who aren't like super famous in the world and stuff like that. But there's, there's something that just sort of connects you I think a bit more when you know someone's from from where you live um and stray kids are really funny because sometimes when they do when they do a rap or something like that it comes out and it sounds like um i think what they used to call it skip hop like aussie hip-hop and it just comes out sounding totally like aussie hip-hop and it just it just makes me laugh so much when um uh when they do that there's if you if you listen to stray kids I think one of my favorite ones for the having like just the the overtly Aussie thing is a song of theirs called Awkward Silence, uh, and it's got a few lines in it that are just like, oh my god, that is like, because one of the guys I think in Bang Chan I think the leader of the group is from I think he's the one from like Seven Hills or something, and it's just totally like just an Aussie. He, he sounds like an Aussie school kid accent, and I'm just like, that is just so good. It's so funny. Um, so I think, like, little bits of that, like, it's like, the rest of the music's amazing, though. Like, some of it's so good. It's got, like, this, like, awesome kind of, um, that, that kind of K-pop rap feel, and, like, um, it just, it just bumps. So sometimes when I really need to get going and I need to get work done or something, I put that on the background. K-pop's really good for me for working, too, because, um, because it doesn't have lyrics, um, it means that I can, because, you know, my work, my work is, like, full of words, right, so that's all the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, um, because my work is so wordy, I can't have words happening, um, while I'm, while I'm thinking about it, and sometimes you really need a, you need a pump up, I don't know if anyone else has been feeling this, um, I don't know if this is, like, residual kind of lockdown feeling or something like that, but especially, like, last week, and over the weekend, I was just, like, I, I, I don't know, it's hard to, it's really hard to explain the feeling, but the, the feeling for me, I think, was just, um, I think the only thought, the only emotion I could express over the weekend was just, don't want, and that's it. I'd, I'd run out of anything else other than just enough energy to just push everything away and just go, I can't do anything, I can't, I can't be anything, I can't do anything, I'm just, I'm just over it all, you know, and, um, I thought, like, you know, I nearly wasn't going to say anything about this, I was nearly going to be like, oh, just, just roll on, you know, they have this thing called Dr. Spotlight, this is from my time working in theatre, we used to talk about Dr. Spotlight being, um, once you're on stage, you're not sick anymore, you know, like, once you're on, um, once you're on and you're under the lights, you're not sick. So you can be like coughing your lungs out and you go on stage and you deliver, you know? Um, and I find I do the same thing where once the camera's on and once I'm lecturing, I'm great, I'm fine. There are no problems. There are like, I can, I can handle anything, but it's really not, it's like a, it's a veneer over the truth in a sense. And like, and I think that's something that we need to sort of watch out for because we're always going to have friends who are struggling and friends who are having trouble and stuff like that. And a lot of people you know are going to be really good at, um, at making it look like everything's okay. And especially, especially you get someone like me. Um, my, en my entire profession 
is based on um, creating a persona so that I can carry people on a journey. So my entire persona, it's a dramatic persona. So it's all about me saying, here is the joy of, of programming. Um, and, and here is the joy that you can get from, from solving your problems and from becoming a, a, a kind of a better person in life and stuff. And because I take people on that journey, they think I'm at the other end of it. So they think that I'm like this successful human being who has who's, who's made it to the end of this um, this difficult journey and they don't have difficulties anymore. And it's like, that's, you know, you know it, but you forget, it. you know, we all know it, but we forget that it is not true at all. Like we've all got problems. Um, and sometimes those problems get to the point where you're just like, fuck it all. You know, like this whole life, I, I just don't want it. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah, it's, it's been really rough, because I, I spent basically the whole weekend under that. I don't know how I got to there from Stray Kids. <laughs> I think it's because I use Stray Kids to dig myself out from those situations, because they're so upbeat and positive and full of energy and stuff like that. And then you wonder, you wonder underneath it all, like these amazing performers doing this stuff, what's happening underneath there? Because I know, like, underneath, like, underneath loving K-pop, I know that it's kind of an industry. Someone else is getting most of the money, and they're driving these people to the brink of exhaustion to the, for them to create their um, their amazing content. So I think that, like, even, even those people who are going to be, like, household names and very famous and rich and stuff like that are probably still doing it really, really tough. Um, so... I always have to, like, you know, if I'm ever going to say anything like that, I have to end it with some kind of, um, something that I can give you. And I think the idea is to, um, look out for each other. Look out for your friends. Um, I think, like, it's, it's weird because there's, you're going to get some of your friends who are really bubbly and you think that they're, like, invincible. Um, they're the ones who are going to be hiding it the most, but you're also going to get other friends that just go quiet sometimes you you kind of want to be like I don't, I don't know I don't know I'm not a psychologist I don't know how to bring people out of something like this if I did maybe I could help myself better than I do but just look out for each other um be friends for each other that kind of thing you know I think you know I think you know if you if you've been my student and you've been um been been through like courses with me and stuff like that you you kind of know my my attitude towards everything being that like us looking after each other is more important than us actually getting good work done and i always want to i always want that to be the message that like and i don't know i don't know i don't know whether that's a good message for for a university to be giving and stuff but i still i still really feel like i want to give that message which is like if we all kind of look after each other then we're we're, we're going to get good work done eventually like the people that want us to convert our salaries into into product are going to get good things out of us but we're going to do it because we care about it and we love it and because we want to do it um and not because we're we're just grinding ourselves to nothing to make it happen you know what i think i think this always happens to me this always happens to me just after a term finishes so the term always finishes on a high and we're all kind of like happy about where we're where we've we've gone to and what we've accomplished and stuff like that and then after that happens for me it just drops into this thing where you go all right you now have to get like 50 hours of marking done in two or three days um you also have to now deal with the plagiarism cases which is always like the psychologically that's like one of the worst bits of the job that you have to do because you put all your all your heart and soul into these courses to teach people um things and you really want to inspire people to to be the best they can be and then you have to look at the evidence that shows you that a percentage of those people are being uh, are not looking to be the best they can be they're looking to look like they're better than they are and it's just kind of like right and so i think i i always go on this kind of emotional kind of like up and then straight down kind of thing and i'm pretty sure that's what last weekend was was me me kind of dealing with that in a probably quite an unhealthy way but I actually had a few friends around who were like not around in person I, I don't know Sydney not, not not so great for that right now but like who knows but like I just had a couple of friends who I, I chatted to here and there and stuff like that it's so like I was talking to a friend of mine I was like yeah dude work is like I don't know right now 
and he was like, yeah, Dirk, tell me about it. I know exactly what you mean. And I was just like, yeah. I thought that was quite funny because, like, he's someone who, like, especially from your perspective as, as my students, you think, like, he's he's the dream that you want to be. He's like a manager at Atlassian now. He's, like, pretty high up in their ranks and stuff like that. But it was just kind of funny, us both, just going, man. Just I just I just don't want right now. I just don't want to work. Just don't want whatever it is that's happening. And so it's like, yeah, it's it's interesting. And I, I think um, I think that's the thing. I think um, you got to lean on your friends when you can. I mean, that's advice I need to take more. I don't I don't take it very much. Like I'm really bad at taking that advice. I'm one of those idiots who thinks that um, their own. Um, their own kind of hard work and gusto will just carry them through everything. And I think I've gotten that way through um, making it look like things are okay all the time. And it's probably not, not a great idea. Um, so lean on your friends, but also let your friends lean on you when you're in a good place and you need to help them. So I think, um, I think this is going to be happening a bit now for you as students. Like it's just going to be a bit delayed from me because when everyone gets their exam marks back, and stuff like so like a lot of you have just finished comp 1511 with me so you're still waiting for your marks we're doing the marking now people are bending themselves over backwards to do the marking i actually just sent a message to my tutors today just to say look the way this schedule works is like roughly in previous terms some previous terms we've had literally half the number of students that we have now in the same amount of time to finish this marking so please talk to me if there's an issue. You know, if you can't get this marking done, that's something we will work with. It's not something we'll force you to, to finish um, on time. Because I'm prepared to, like, if I have to, you know, like, I know it's rough for you because this will mean your marks will be delayed if, if I have to do this. But I'm prepared to kind of go back to the university and go, look, I know, I know that you tried to help us by putting us on really, really early in the exam period, um, but we still had 850 exams. To mark and a lot of the people um because i have to spread out the marking a lot of those people doing the marking had their own exams to do so this wasn't something that we could just turn around immediately and make happen so if we miss the deadline i, I do apologize we did put a great deal of effort into uh making the deadline but i would never have the people under me break themselves for um for a deadline i would prefer the deadline to blow out than um than for my, my tutors marking parts of the exam and stuff like that to end up with like, oh, I didn't sleep for two days because I was doing work for the university. I'm just like, no, 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 the university should never be making you work under those conditions. So that's my responsibility to make sure they don't work under those conditions. Um, and if that means that I don't make the, the deadline for the mark submission, then I will wear that, you know, I'll be like, I'll apologize to you as my students, but also, um, have a chat with the people above me at the university and go, hey, look, it was a lot of students. It was a record number of students. So I don't, like, we've never made this deadline by more than 24 hours before. So this significant increase in students on the same deadline, I'm not sure how we ever expected this to work. So we'll do what we can, though. We'll do what we can. Uh, at least this term, you're in a lucky position in that um, I'm not teaching next term. So I don't have to split my work because usually now I would be split between um, marking and finalizing the course and spinning it back up again to start again in a couple of weeks time, um, which is super, super stressful. But uh, this time, at least I don't have that stress on top of things. So maybe it'll be okay. Anyway, <laughs> I love how I've had this slide up this whole time, but I haven't actually gotten to it. So we will get there eventually. I mean, like, you know, you know that the, that the whole point of Mark on Mondays is not about, um, it's not about this being, uh, those kinds of university lectures where I'm under an intense time pressure to deliver a, a huge amount of topic material to people in two hours. It's much more conversational. Also, there's only 11 slides as opposed to my usual kind of 30 to 40 slides for two hours. So we should be okay getting through this. I should also go through chat because what I, I have been as you can tell by I mean like it got pretty serious what I've been talking about and stuff uh you you can tell I'm just sort of like I'm in my own head here but what I should do is actually talk to all of you who have come here to 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 to, to, to not just listen but to also um to also talk about stuff so 
So, going back, way back there, people were talking about... Zach asked who's taking minutes. I think this is when I started talking about uh, graphics. I mean, all of this is going to be uh, saved, and it'll still be on my YouTube channel. It's the same as if anyone wants to watch the entirety of Comp 1511 on YouTube. Oh, hang on a second. I think somebody's coming in. <laughs> I'm not sure. One moment. I'm just gonna call my partner's phone so that she can find it. <laughs> oh, hello. I thought I thought it was chicken. What are you doing? Eat little chicky. Yes. Yes. You wanna say hello? Did you hear her saying hello? Oh, you got it? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just helping my partner find her phone. Anyway, there's a little bit of chicken as well. So, I think everyone everyone was here for chicken, obviously. And, and, and there it was. Anyway, okay, okay, okay. So let me go through, go through a chat and at least say hi to everyone who's been saying hi. Um, Hamish is asking me if I'm doing the course next year. Um, 3421 graphics. Um, that's the plan. Um, the... The plan is definitely for... Well, actually, it's not really set in stone. 2022, uh, we haven't talked scheduling for 2022. But I think that it will be reasonably likely that I will do the 1511 in Term 1 and the 3421 in Term 3, and I'll just keep doing those two like that. Um, I don't think I will want to, this year, develop a new course next year develop another new course or something like that but we also have a lot of um new staff coming in so i don't know i think it's yeah it's public information that we're hiring new teaching staff um these are education focused staff so it's um it's it's people like myself who are not necessarily research academics but academics who are going to have like sort of the same as me, sort of like 80-90% of your time devoted to teaching, as opposed to like your your bog standard university academic, which is like 50% research, 50% teaching, and so you know that those people, you're only going to get to see them um, like maybe once or twice a year teaching, whereas me, you're more likely to see two or three times a year teaching, so. But I haven't looked at the schedule, I uh, haven't talked about the schedule either, because I think um, uh, John Shepard, who does most of the... Um, deciding which courses are going to run when and stuff like that um, we haven't had the conversation about 2022 yet i mean also like <laughs> just quietly i'm on a fixed term contract at unsw so like at the moment i will not be here forever um but uh i don't know whether we haven't talked about extending or rehiring me or anything like that that's another conversation that's probably still still at least a few months away um, but we will talk about that later. <laughs> I'm not announcing, I'm not announcing that I'm resigning from UNSW or anything like that, but like, I'm not on a, like, when you talk about like, uh, um, Richard Buckland taught me when I was an undergrad student. So you're like, that's a very different situation where like, he's been here for like more than 20 years and stuff like that. So like, um, they're, they're permanent. Whereas I'm on a, um, I think I'm on a three year that started at the start of 2020 so like my contract goes until the end of 2022 um but that's not to say that i will be like just booted out immediately at the end of 2022 there's still a conversation that will be had about that anyway so zach said where's my paypal link i think this is when i was talking to um uh talking about like how much money i was making and stuff but i don't mind like i don't have to make money oh peter was said hi hi peter how's it going um, Izzy said 60 cents, you could buy some lollies like 15 years ago with that, yes. Um, I think that was just 60 cents, like, directly after the live stream. I think if I'd left monetization on and people had kept watching it and stuff, because it got, like, something like 600 views afterwards, um, it would have gotten more, but then at the same time, I'm like, it's not, I'm not looking to make money out of this. Like, if I wasn't working for UNSW and I wanted to make money on YouTube, then yes, I would leave monetization on, but I would probably be doing more and different stuff. Like, I wouldn't just be doing, okay, this stuff is completely focused on my students, you know, and my students are already paying 
I don't want them to have to pay twice in a sense, you know, even though it's only an ad, it's still, yeah. So it's like, okay, this, this is fine. We'll just keep this connected to my work and I'll just assume in a sense that UNSW is already paying me and I will take their money and I will do things like this for students, you know, it makes sense. And this is the funny thing about being a lecturer is you get a lot of um, autonomy in that I can decide that I want to make sure that I have this connection with students and I'm keeping things going. I'm keeping things like this public for people. And even like this, like, no one usually says, all right, I'm going to publicize the entire back end thinking of what I'm going to do um, for how I build a course. But I feel like students really want to know that kind of thing. You let me know if you really want to know it, because I think it could be really interesting. Anyway, <laughs> uh, D-Wang was saying people want Super Chat and you want to be a channel member and stuff. Uh, Tom and Blake said, play some modal jazz for us. I, um, I played jazz for like nearly a decade. So, yes, technically I can play modal jazz for you. That's not actually entirely out of reach. <laughs> I'd have to go back and relearn it and, and stuff. But, like, it's really funny. Like, um, it was talking about the, the music thing. This is going back through chat. I'm, like, half an hour behind in chat here, but I thought I'd at least answer things that people said. Um, I actually, um, at high school, I was kind of, like, I wasn't technical in a sense, the way I am now. Although it's very weird to think of me as a technical person because my entire job is public speaking um, and structuring human communication. So one could say that I am an entirely creative person who happens to be in a technical field. Um, but yeah, I topped my school in music. So <laughs> it was like, how did I end up in software engineering? You know, it's like, it's weird, these decisions that you make and then where you end up going in life and stuff. It's quite interesting. Um, yeah. Um, Shreya asked if I can make a Comp 1511 theme song, and D Wang said, Pretty sure the theme is just internalized screaming. <laughs> I feel bad. So, yes, I put a lot of work into the course and stuff like that, but I do understand that, like, it's not the easiest thing in the world for everyone. Um, it's it's a weird subject because it's designed to kind of in some ways equalize by uplifting a whole bunch of people who have never programmed before. I get some decent feedback from people. I do. I, I've got some lovely emails over the last couple of weeks, emails and discord messages from some of you um, thanking me for the, the course and stuff like that. So that's really nice. The, my experience feedback is coming in soon. That will be probably more productive and less just like, I think when people reach out and email you, they usually have something nice to say. I've never had anyone reach out and email to me telling me everything that's wrong with the course. That would be interesting. Probably, probably quite useful actually, but you know. Um, yeah. Uh, what else was I going to say? I can't remember where I was going with that. doesn't matter. Um, yeah, people ask me if I lis listen to music and then the Mark, Mark Mix. We'll do them. I'll do a Mark Mix at some point. Um, Asher was asking what producing software did we use? Um... We were using, uh, what was it called? Pro Tools. Um, much earlier iteration, I used to use Acid. Um, I don't know if that even still exists. Um, I think Vegas and Acid were... Who was making that? Sonic Foundry? I don't know if they even exist as a company anymore. Maybe they got bought by Adobe or something. <laughs> Waleed said, hello, how are we doing? Has chicken been shown? Chicken has now been shown. Yes. And Kaichi didn't know that there were Aussies in K-pop groups. There's the two, um, Bang Chan and Felix in Stray Kids. Felix is probably one of the most um, noticeable people in Stray Kids because he's the one with like that really, really deep, um, boomy voice that they use as like the hype guy in between, like in, in the songs and stuff like that. So he's from Sydney and the leader Bang Chan who does like the, um, the kind of singing breaks in between the raps is also um, from Sydney. So pretty cool and also rosé obviously she's like the probably one of the most famous k-pop people in the world is from melbourne so that's i think that's pretty cool i think we're doing pretty well for ourselves the aussies are represented in some of the biggest groups in the world um is you saying you like your favorite song to pump you up on the way to the gym i think that's good i feel like my life would be better if i went to the gym but i can't be bothered 
it's really bad i need i need to be healthy i used to um like i was at a point where i was like doing bicycle races like once a month kind of thing a few years back and then i just sort of dropped it i have this habit of picking up hobbies getting deep into them and then going oh i'm bored now after like three or four years and then just moving on and doing something else so um like i went from riding bikes all the time to painting little miniatures and uh and in doing that i ended up um I ended up going from like being super super active and super healthy to just sitting down for hours at a time which is not good because my entire job is sitting down for hours at a time as well okay catching up on chat um people said they still have exams going so i do understand we're still in the middle of the exam period aren't we so i forget because my exam's finished and i'm into um I'm into the pain of marking now, so it's like, it's a different, I, I've already switched to a different phase, forgetting that a lot of, a lot of you as the students are still in, um, in exams. Blake said you felt like that all of last year, so this is, we're getting to the bit where I was talking about, you know, those, those issues we get with, like, just trying to, trying to keep ourselves going, trying to keep ourselves able to continue, and I feel like when you're talking about last year, talking about, um, what's what I call it, talking about, I think it was dealing with lockdown. I think lockdown broke a lot of us. I think a lot of us came out of 2020 not really, like, just not the same people we were going in. I think I went into 2020 with a bit of hope and a bit of, like, kind of, like, survived 2019. So I survived 2019 as a lecturer, and 2020 I wanted to, like, kind of flourish as a lecturer. I wanted to be, like, now that I've found my feet... I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to, I'm going to make this course amazing. I'm going to make it something that people will remember for all through their education and their lives because they learned something valuable. And I hope I'm still doing that a little bit for some people. Um, but what I ended up doing was like just managing a abrupt shift into online teaching. And, and I know heaps of people who, um, heaps of lecturers, uh, people having to do that were, were not really in a position to do that um in a comfortable way like a lot of people were um like like i was live streaming before covid so it was kind of like i'll just do it for all the lectures we're ready we just do it you know it was a novelty before and some of the other lecturers were like oh that's that's really interesting you're doing these live streams so what is it like you you interact in real time with the chat and then you you're you're doing these kind of like worked examples and stuff like that outside of lecture time that seems to be really useful and i was like yeah it's it's pretty cool I feel, i'm pretty sure this is the way that we communicate you know we in this like technical generation we communicate via stuff like streaming and stuff like that it's not like like a, a traditional lecture it's more like an old school tv show that only happens at a certain time of the week and you have to you have to be there at that time to watch it it's like it's really really old school whereas like you know video on demand or live streaming, live interaction is something that's probably a lot more important. But yeah. Anyway, where am I going? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it was like, um, Ada turned up. Hello, Ada. Wait, is this Ada as in like, you work for me, Ada? I'm not sure if it is or not. <laughs> Stray. I used to use Acid, Mark G, 2021. I knew as I said it, as I said it, I was like, oh, that is going to sound incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> that is gonna sound like an endorsement of taking drugs in order to make music um i mean if you're the beatles and <laughs> and you wanna you wanna make a song called lucy in the sky with diamonds which stands for lsd which is as far as i know the active ingredient in acid um then then you can do that if you want and you will still end up being one of the the biggest bands in the world but you were also very creative before that happened um you taking uh those of us who are just kind of like we could get involved but we're not like the creative geniuses that can entertain the whole world the greatest songwriters of all time if you're one of the greatest songwriters of all time and you take acid something cool is going to come out of it if you're like one of us and you take acid you just like sit on the couch and drool for three hours or something like that right? it's not going to be the same <laughs> i'm not endorsing that you take acid and make music um D Wang heard that your Pro Tools sucked. Um, I don't think any of the kind of systems that we use. I'm I'm being like a really wide, 
um, idea here. Like a lot of the systems that we use for digital art production are incredibly difficult to use. I, I watched, I had friends teaching people how to use um, like Maya and Photoshop and stuff because I used to used to do stuff in computer games and so like they were they were teaching people how to make assets for computer games in these things and it was just it was such a minefield and it was it was always these situations where um you needed these monstrously powerful computers to be able to work with these programs because like um Maya for example is like the 3D modeling software would would be like if you don't have at least sort of three or four gigs of RAM just free and ready waiting, this thing won't even start. Uh, and then as you start working, it'll just, it'll chomp up gigs of RAM as you're going. And you have a look at this thing and it's like, well, we're using 12 gigs of RAM to, to work on these assets right now. It's like, where, how did we get here? <laughs> you know? And then you start have to be, having to be actually quite careful because the second you go out of your physical RAM and you start paging your RAM to your hard drive, then you're no longer... Your, your creative process is, is gone then because you're waiting a few seconds for every action to happen. So this is a, it's really interesting. Um, I think there might be a world, I always love saying this stuff, where you <laughs> find a way to build software for artists that doesn't force artists to use software. You know what I mean? Like if we, if we can get to a point where we're not... Um, where, where the, the flow of the artist... Is, continues as the flow of an artist and they don't get forced into becoming technical craftspeople you know it's a different skill the difference between art and, and craft you can be like carpentry is a craft and you have to learn how to use the tools you have to learn how to like you know be safe with these tools and how the wood reacts to you attacking it um but you want to be an artist with sculpting wood then it's about like what is your creative process what's your vision how do you how do you use these tools and so you you kind of get the craft out of the way and so that you can get to your art in a sense i mean some people live their life in the craft that's totally cool as well um and i find that the systems we use for making digital art very very often force people into the craft and they take the they take their chance to create artistry away from them i don't think that's a I don't, I don't want that to be a blanket statement that's like that that does that to everyone i've seen plenty of people be super super creative with digital painting tools and stuff like that um but i think that we could um as computer scientists we could make these interfaces work in a much better way like if anyone's ever just opened photoshop and looked at the number of buttons that are on screen and you just go whoa whoa what do all these things do and, and, and it's like, you know, two years later, you're like, I am now functional in Photoshop. And it's like, wow, that shouldn't have been like that. Like, you can give people paint and a canvas and they can get stuff done. And then two years later, they're like, oh, I learned more of these subtleties of these things. But yes, I could, get, I could put paint on canvas from the very beginning, you know? Um, I think our digital tools for doing the same things don't necessarily support people like that. Anyway, that's... That's a whole nother essay from Mark, a whole nother, another hours long rant from me about things. Um, people saying, wow, someone's, someone's name is fuck off Google. <laughs> I apologize, we're on YouTube, Google owns this. Um, people taking, take, J-Man said you played Lion King for yours. They're talking for your HSC. Blake said Zelda music for your HSC. That's going to be funny to see what music people study to. Um, where, did, where did everyone else got to... Came from the mark, stayed for the K-pop trivia from Fuck Off Google. Michael says, hey, looks like I haven't missed anything. <laughs> yeah, because this is me, right? Once I start talking, I'll talk, and I won't even get to the things that I've planned to talk about. Blake said that they used to go for walks a lot. I think that's pretty cool. I should I should just go for a walk. I mean, sometimes because I don't know people people on the CSC like Discord have noticed because I like sometimes, especially when I'm in a in a bad mood, like I will just game like and I'll just turn on a game and I'll play it until like four a.m. and then I'll be like, you have to go to sleep, and I'll be like, my my brain at that point is like, I don't want to go to sleep. I don't care about sleep. I don't care about anything. And then I just keep playing games until like, okay, I can hear birds and the sky's getting blue. Fine, I'll go to sleep. Um, 
I have a feeling that I'd be in a much better position if, like, at that point where I'm like, I want to put a game on, maybe I should put, like, Stray Kids in my headphones and go for a walk around the block, even if it is 3 a.m. or something. And I don't necessarily endorse everyone doing that. Like, it depends on, like, it's not always safe <laughs> to just go walking around in the middle of the night on your own. But maybe I'd be okay. I don't know. It's reasonably safe where I live. Anyway, j men said just exercise at home. Maybe I should get, like, a Wii Ring Fit. I have friends who got that instead it's actually kind of fun. Um, Izzy said gym is hard and you only go because you have a really motivating fun coach. I feel like I feel like that might be a thing, right? If you have people to do things with, then it works pretty well. I used to do that because I used to do kung fu, um, and um, my teacher was really really cool. He was heaps of fun. Um, um, he's actually an author. Um, so it was really cool because like I was learning Kung Fu from him as he was just getting his his writing career like he was getting published for the first time and stuff like that and so it was very exciting for him and now he's like an, an established kind of horror uh, horror genre fiction author I guess you would call it I don't know um, and and so he's established and he makes his money from that but he still teaches Kung Fu now which is really cool um, I don't learn from him anymore unfortunately because he moved uh um, down to Wollongong and stuff so that he could have a house start his family and stuff like that and I always feel sad because I think I was actually more attached to him as a teacher than I was attached to the idea of learning Kung Fu so I thought that was kind of fun it was also just a really funny thing of just like um, Chinese boys learning Kung Fu is like there's a part of us it's like oh we're getting in touch with that culture but we just really want to learn how to fight <laughs> it's, it's a funny it's a funny connection it's very funny um Jennifer's saying there's a content creator whose Twitch is dedicated to playing games while on an exercise bike to keep him accountable for daily exercise. I think that could be quite funny. Uh, the, <laughs> that, like, yeah. I actually did that when I was doing my PhD, is I, um, I had, um, rollers. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. It's track cyclists use these things called rollers, where you put a normal bike on these cylinders that just provide resistance and they roll. And the funny thing about the rollers is like you're just riding your bike on top of these 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 rollers and and that's it like so there's nothing keeping it upright you're just keeping it upright via your balance and so it's really really freaky if you've never done it before but i got to the point where i was training on the rollers with research papers on an ipad on the on, the, on top of my handlebars and i was just there just reading while i was riding um, and that was pretty good because I, I was getting like active blood flow to my brain while I was using it. So I'm just like that, that actually worked pretty well for a while. Um, not that I finished the PhD, PhD for, for me, the PhD had, had other issues that stopped me from finishing. And I was just like, I can't do it. I'm so tired. <laughs> the same feeling I had last week, but like, imagine that just stretching out for like most of a year. And I was like, by the end of that, I was like, I can't, this, this is a dumb idea. Why am I even here? I think some people, like, I had friends who finished PhDs easily, um, and I think this is a different mindset. Um, I think I'm just not that good at that kind of um, research thinking. That doesn't sound like our music anymore. Oh, no, it is. It is. Oh, no, not too bad. It's very, very quiet in the background here, so I couldn't hear it clearly. I did really enjoy this song, Crooked Path. Kurunji is also a great song. Uh, it's the epic 8 and 13 minute songs that I really enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay oh easy said comp 151 already is amazing and peter said you do 100 percent did that in 2020 so people are saying that they did really enjoy comp 1511 sam also agreed that you had fond memories of 1511 in term one last year i find that very impressive and thank you very much samuel because that was the most disrupted term for us that was the hardest one for us to do because we had to just kind of drop everything and shift it online in week five. Sunny said the fact that Comp 1511 transitioned so well in 2020 is amazing in itself. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we had good warning and we thought about it really carefully. So Tom and myself at this point, um, I'd heard whispers about it around the place and stuff that like, the the virus was not contained the virus was going to get to australia um and if we couldn't have physical contact what were we going to do and so we'd already started making plans um 
so it was kind of like when the suggestion came that we were going to have to switch, we'd already like that was that was a, a rough kind of week before that, but we'd already planned out ideas of things. We'd already tested a couple of different um, pieces of software for going online. For me, it was easy. I got this. I got this YouTube thing. It was ready to go. Um, but um, for the tutorials and stuff, it was like oh. It's just choosing between so many bad options. Because back then, especially at the start of 2020, none of the kind of... Uh, sort of... Meeting systems, I guess. I don't know what to call them. Video chat systems. Were ready for teaching. At that point. I mean, I guess they all were to an extent. You can still deliver something. But not with the right amount of interactivity. And they're still not that great. We ended up with Blackboard Collaborate because it had more kind of real-time interactivity going back and forth. You could see lots of people's faces if you wanted to and stuff. But I mean, we still get that hilarious situation where like when we're teaching, no one's gonna, no one wants to turn their camera on, um, no one wants to turn their mic on. So it didn't matter how good our systems were. Um, once you start isolating people, they're going to remain isolated, you know? So that's, like, it was very hard to, um, to do that. Shrey's confirming that yes, Ada is the tutor Ada. I should give you moderator rights, Ada. I need to find where you typed something. Ada, if you're still there, type something in so that I can add you as a moderator. Um, okay, let me see what else I have. Wait, where am I up to? Just download more RAM. <laughs> I think Hussein was talking about me talking about, like, uh, Maya and Photoshop and stuff. <laughs> exactly. Maya or Google Chrome. Google Chrome's different, I think, because Google Chrome will relinquish the RAM if it's used it, but, like, um, <laughs> it will, like, um, it will use as much RAM as it can so that it's very responsive. It tries to keep everything memory resident. Um, yeah, people are laughing about... Um, Pro Tools, Photoshop, and stuff like that. Oh, D Wayne was saying that Ableton is better and FL Studio. See, I have done, I haven't done it in so long. I don't even know what FL Studios is. But Ableton, I'd heard of, and I heard Ableton was quite good. Maybe it was Ableton. I don't know. The last gig we did was in like two thousand and seven, so like it's just been so long ago. I remember like it was myself and one of the vocalists who were working on a lot of the production stuff together and we, we did these weird kind of experimental um uh gigs where we would do songs where um we'd start off really slow and then we'd accelerate 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 up until the tempo and then we'd hit the start of the song and the weirdest thing about it was the way that we were doing that is i had a click track going in my head for the tempo that we were going to reach and then I set the tempo for the band as the really slow tempo and then worked up and worked up and worked up. But what I had to do was I had to get us so that when we matched the right tempo, we'd hit the first beat on the first beat so that the drum machine would kick in at exactly the same time with the one beat. And so it was like, it was always this kind of thing where I'm just like, yeah, okay, that's going. Yes. All right. All right, everyone. Yeah, I can get us to that one. Yeah. All right. All right, all right, yeah, we're speeding up, we're speeding up, I mean, it was like a minute long speed up, <laughs> and it was like some nights, it was just like, I did not hit that, and other nights it was like, yes, we hit it, perfect, and stuff, it was a really weird way to play music, um, but I guess if anyone's going to want to get really deep into the um, connecting technology and music together, it's going to be like, someone like me is going to want to do that kind of thing. Um... Oh, Zach was saying the old Apple used to have that vision of, like, the, the art and technology. I mean, Apple, I think, has... If there's one thing that Apple has done as a company... I mean, there's many things Apple's done as a company. It's a giant company. But one of the things that Apple did as a company was um, try to bring in more design for humans into a technological space. Um, wait, now we have crossed over to music that's not ours. Yeah. Okay, okay playlist time you can also 
join this playlist. I'm going to turn my my volume down now <laughs> because if any of this gets into the audio stream, I will end up with a copyright strike. But we're going to listen to, I think, listen to the most recent... Oh, that's not even the most recent, but like listen to the most recent album called Go Live from Stray Kids because it has God's Menu on it, which is like... I don't want to say it's the best song in K-pop because <laughs> that's starting a fight. <laughs> but for me, it's, it's one of my favourite songs in K-pop. Um, and it's also got a couple of other songs uh, on this that are that are pretty amazing as well. I think, actually, no, it's not this. There's a, there's a the, the album before this has got Backdoor as well, which is really awesome, um, and it's got We Go, which is like a subunit song, which is really good as well. Um, but yeah, actually, maybe we'll listen to that one. Maybe maybe we will go back to Stray Kids, and we will listen to the In Life. This was like their, they called it a repackage album. They took heaps of the songs they'd done before and did again. So some of my favorites, Backdoor is an amazing song. We Go, super amazing song. Um, not as popular, apparently, as the other songs. I love how K-pop bands, it's like, this, they measure things in millions. <laughs> but yeah, okay, this is, this is what we're going to listen to. So if you want to listen to this with me, In Life by Stray Kids, we're going to press play now. Um, and, um, and that can be our, our, our background music for the, for the next hour probably until the end of the stream we'll see how we go i'm gonna have it really quietly going on in the background here um izzy was asking me if i do digital art i i don't do digital art i do i do much more um i guess i guess you would call it real art it's not i i, I hate the idea that digital art's not real art it's all real art um let me just just so you can see the camera really big so there's a bunch of my paints and brushes. There's a little Funko Pop Bob Ross. He falls over a bit. His head's very big. Um, here's something that I was working on recently, but I haven't obviously haven't started. I just built it. It's like a spaceship from the Warhammer universe. If anyone's played the Battlefleet Gothic game, this is this is from that. Um, yeah, and so I've got that stuff. There's if you <laughs> hey if you want to look at any of it, like I think people have quite a long time ago discovered my instagram which is just mark chi instagram so I, I have a heaps of stuff which is under my full name um yeah um so i do that kind of art i've thought about getting into digital art heaps um nick nick sims was saying hey you know the number one advice for starting to paint minis of course i think it's like just paint more minis <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of people say that uh, fuck off google is miles hi miles i will i will call i'll try to call you miles instead of fuck off google <laughs> and blake saying podcasts are great for walks sunny wang said in real life stream when i think that would be quite funny I, I've, I've 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 promised to do that at some point and maybe even do that with lectures where i set up my streaming rig at the lecture deliver the lecture to people in person while it's also going to people online i feel like that would be really cool I'm not hearing any of the music. I need to turn it up a bit. Um, Beat Saber workout with an Oculus. I think that could be interesting. Um, yeah, I think people get surprised. Peter saying you were surprised by the allure of Beat Saber. I think people definitely get surprised by the fact that um, Beat Saber is so um, so addictive, yet also good exercise. Okay, I need to skip over a lot of the, the chat so that I can... Um, be present rather than just talking to people who were talking to me 10 minutes ago. At least I'm only 10 minutes ago. Oh, Jennifer knows about the rollers because you've watched an anime about cycling. Oh, I should watch more anime. Like, I've been, like, um, been wanting to get into getting into some things, but I mean, I'm watching, um, The Legend of Korra, which I'd never seen before. Um, and people know that I love Avatar because it goes, if it goes into the lectures, it means I have, I have a connection with it. Um, but, yeah, I, I was thinking, it's like, oh, I don't have time to watch anime. And I realized in the last year or two, I watched all of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. So I watched like 700 episodes of anime in the last like two years. So it's like, it's fine, I can watch anime. But I was thinking about whether I should watch like Attack on Titan, which has got a pretty good rep. 
and My Hero Academia, like the ones that I hear about heaps, and should I watch those? And JoJo's Bizarre Adventure just turned up on Netflix. I'm just like, oh, maybe I should watch that. I was watching One Piece for a bit as well, and I was like, I didn't, I really enjoyed it, but I just didn't keep, didn't keep going with it. I don't know why. I think I like watched One Piece for like ten episodes, and then went back to Dragon Ball and watched another two hundred episodes of that instead. <laughs> People are like, oh my god, Stray Kids, God's Menu, yeah. And Blake was saying, yeah, go live. But I went back to, um, rather than go live, I went back to In Life because it's got some really cool songs that I like. And it's also still got God's Menu on it. But We Go is the one that gets stuck in my head a lot of the time. Don't know why, but it does. Um, okay, okay, okay. Let's, um... I, I've nearly caught up now. <laughs> William Rage said no Blackstone Fortresses. I don't know how big a Blackstone Fortress would be in in scale. Like, in terms of, like, this ship scale, it would at least be, like... Like, this is a frigate, and it's, like, 20 centimetres long, so it's, like, it's like, like what you'd think of, like, a... the scale of people who do scale... scale model warships or something like this. Like, apparently this thing's got a crew of, like, 2,000 people or something like that. So, maybe that... A Blackstone Fortress would be like yay large or something, but I don't think I'd ever be able to do that. Alex Chen asked me what my favorite K-pop group is, and I I find this hard. This is a hard thing to answer because I don't never want to like just kind of narrow it down to only one group. So I'll tell you about a few diff different groups. Um, Itzy was the first group that kind of got me into K-pop. Well, I mean like BTS because everyone kind of hears BTS. BTS are nearly not K-pop. I mean they are. But they're nearly bigger than K-pop now, in that they're, like, universal. Like, everyone knows who BTS are. And it's like, what's the first group you listen to after? After BTS draws you into K-pop and then gets you into things. And I think Itzy was, like, the first, because, like, if everyone's heard Wannabe by Itzy, I love that song. And it's got the shoulder dance, which I can't do. But, you know, <laughs> it's always really funny. I was just joking, we did this on stream, with me and, and Dan Matsfield. Um, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> I think I showed him Itzy, and he was like, I don't understand what's going on. I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, Itzy got me into it, and then I discovered Blackpink, um, and absolutely love Blackpink. I think one of the things that got me into Blackpink was I found, like, basically bootlegs on YouTube of their DVDs, of their, um, uh, of their concerts and stuff, and it was like, they pack a punch live. They've got, like, a really kind of, like, um, really strong stage presence, and I really enjoyed that. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. It's like, carried along the drama and the emotion of their, their performance and stuff. And so I got really deep into Blackpink for a while. Um, but then I started exploring, um, listening to Stray Kids, and then that got me onto this... I, I was onto this realisation that I, I must be a JYP fan. JYP is, like, this particular guy, this personality, he owns one of the companies because I already liked two of their, um, two of their groups, and so I started listening to Twice as well, and it's like, Twice is really funny, because it's like this really girly candy pop kind of thing, and I think it's very, very Japanese-influenced, because like, it, it sounds like the J-pop of the, of the 90s and stuff, before K-pop was even really a thing, um, but I think it's really cute as well, I think, they're like, and I just love how all of the groups, especially the bigger groups, have got this kind of, like, the personalities within the group and then they you go through and you learn the stories about them and like you go oh now i know this person's name now i've learned who this person is and they do this thing in the group and stuff like that and it's like it's so funny because you realize that the drama that holds you into stories is the same everywhere it's the same reason why everyone in like everyone who loves like comics loves like the marvel universe and you go you could ask someone if they knew the terminology you ask someone in the marvel universe oh what's your bias and you go oh this is my bias in the marvel universe i love this thing because of this background and stuff like that and this is the same thing with the um the k-pop idols and it's like ooh, love when i get pop-ups for free stuff i won't necessarily get that right now the epic games just gives you free games all the time like you could you could just get the epic games launcher and then just get free games for months and months yeah um <laughs> someone's like ryujin shoulder dance is such a classic i love how ryujin has become like i just like eclipsed the rest of the group just for doing the shoulder dance and now she's just like huge 
for that. But I mean, it's like, it's pretty cool. She's probably like one of the best dancers in K-pop, so she's like, you know, she's right on it. Uh, Alex is saying the newer Twice releases are such bops. Um, uh, which, oh, what was the name of the song? I know it's bad if I'm a fan. I can't remember the names of all the songs, but um, it was the one that I can't get out of my head. Can't stop me. <laughs> That's like, I love it because it's actually that line that I was like, I was thinking, is it something else? No, but I, I can't get that, that song out of my head sometimes. It's just like, yeah, it's so good. Hard to sing it right now because there's Stray Kids going on in the background. But anyway, yeah. Like, we used to have this challenge of like, can you sing different songs in a row? And they're like, um, like theme songs from different movies in a row. And it's like really, really hard because once you think you want, you can't think of another. Um... Yeah, Jennifer's saying, I only have Epic for the freebies. Yeah. And Peter said, Pine isn't terrible, so you bought it previously. Paris saying, you like Kura Kura? That's the new Twice song. <laughs> you paid for stuff on Epic. I think I only got Epic when Borderlands 3 came out a year earlier than Steam on Epic. I was like, well, I have to have it now. And then I started getting a whole string of free games on it. Um... Oh, Alex is saying retro K-pop is the best thing that's happened in a while. Oh, I got into 21. As in, like, the number 2, N-E-1. Because, I mean, like, you kind of... Like, if, you, if you're going to be a Blink, you've, you've, you've got to listen at least once to 21. Because, like, they're the four-person female, like, K-pop group with a lot of rap in it that came before Blackpink. You know, they're just, like... Are they like 10 years older than I don't know if it's 10 years. It might only be like five or six years older than but they're, they're like an earlier generation of K-pop. And it's and it's sort of like when you hear 21, you, you hear um, CL, like their leader rapping, and you just go, wow, that is like basically how Lisa from Blackpink learned how to rap. Like she raps like like she's like the next generation of, of rapper from CL. And I thought like that's, that's really interesting. Uh, Come Back Home by 21 is just like... It's such an anthem. It just rings in your head and it stays in there for days and days and days. Yeah. Oh, 21 is second gen K pop. Yeah, it is second gen K pop, right? Because they're like 2010. They're like the same era as Psy and stuff like that. Like the K pop that first broke into Western culture. I think like Gangnam Style. This is a funny song to break into Western culture because it's nearly a song that doesn't sound like any of the rest of K pop. But that's the one. That, that, that sort of paved the way for like BTS to take over the world that kind of thing Paris is saying that Lisa's new single is coming soon, yeah I, I find that interesting that um, in this time when no one can tour um, the K-pop groups have to figure out something else to do, I think Blackpink would be touring the world right now if they had a choice and so they wouldn't be making new music but instead what they've done is like alright let's accelerate our other plans so Rosé's um, solo uh, single mini album two songs like two songs is kind of a single came out first and Lisa's is coming out now so I think it's like that um uh that kind of thing where they go all right we have to we have to keep working we want to keep working we want to keep making music we want to keep entertaining people but we can't go to them so what do we do it's like all right let's do all those projects that we've been thinking of doing everything that's been on the back burner because Blackpink had never kind of like, they'd be like, yeah, sure, we did a solo with Jenny. We'll do solos with the rest of them sooner or later. But in in the meantime, we're busy taking over the world. And it's like the world stopped. And it's like, oh, wow. Well, our plans for world domination have, have to go on pause. What else are we going to do? Oh, fine. We'll do all those solos that people keep asking for because we've got time now. <laughs> and it's easier to do a solo when you're, when you're isolated, <laughs> you know. Um... Izzy said people are touring. Who's touring at the moment? I'm not sure how many people are um, um, are going around that much. I don't know. I know people are still doing live things. Um, I watched the, the Blackpink um, streamed concert. I thought that was pretty cool. I um, actually ended up watching it twice because it was rebroadcast in multiple time zones. Um, then found it on YouTube months later, watched it again. It's like, yeah, still a good gig. <laughs> Um, Alex is asking have I watched any Beyond Live concerts I'm not sure if there's um, if that's a particular thing Beyond Live um, yeah 
Uh, is he saying maybe scheduled for June? I think that, like, when we look at, like, sort of vaccine rollout, um, or in Australia, we don't even need that much vaccine rollout. It's just sort of majority suppression of, of the virus. It's, it's possible, especially if you do outdoor gigs. It's possible. I mean, the fact that we're doing outdoor sports, we're putting thousands of people in a stadium anyway. From what I heard from the science, that's reasonably safe in that dissipation of the virus into air makes it much less transferable. But don't quote me on that. I'm not like, <laughs> not an epidemiologist, but I understand that they have less of an issue with um, uh, the with uh, open air sports than they have an issue with um, even things like classrooms and restaurants and stuff like that are much more uh, significant spreaders. Anyway, um... Izzy said, oh, you saw some of the metal bands have concerts planned, so that'd be cool. Paris was saying, is JYP doing online concerts? I don't know. Uh, Chewy said, bring back tournaments for Comp 1511. I'm actually bringing back tournaments, but not for Comp 1511. I'm waiting for, um, uh, waiting for the, the exams and marking stuff to die down for me to get time to, um, talk to Zach. Are you still there, Zach? Zach was in chat before. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna be working on a competition structure to do, and so it won't be limited to Comp One Five One One. Everyone will be able to take part. Paris said, "Did you miss the Twice concert? I don't. Was there a Twice concert recently? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't seen it. I have this thing where I like look up stuff. I um. I always look up on YouTube. I just go." Whichever band I'm listening to... Oh, Mamma Moo was one that I listened to. I saw it recently. It's like, Mamma Moo Live. And they set the filter for greater than 20 minutes. And then you'll find their concerts like that. Um, Mamma Moo was so good live, by the way. Like, amazing vocalists. Um, really, really cool um, K-pop group. They're, like, as old as BTS as well. So you can see them just kind of, like, do stuff. But also just kind of stuff up on stage and then laugh at themselves and stuff. And it's like, that energy is so good. It's just so positive. Like, you love it. Um, so Zach said, you finished Math 1B exam this morning. Wait, Math 1B? <laughs> what are you, like, in your, like, third year at UNSW and doing Math 1B? <laughs> right, it's a big accomplishment for you. That's good. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, Zach and I will talk soon. I mean, I'm just about to get really, really busy as well. So, like, it won't, it won't start happening for at least a week. Um, anyway. So... <laughs> I've had this slide up this whole time. I really should have just, like, done this at the beginning and just talked rather than, like, have the slide that I wasn't doing anything with. I thought maybe, maybe we should actually talk about some of the content that I had made especially for today. Granted, it was only, like, you know, two hours or so putting together this content on Friday, but it, it's all content that's based on stuff I've been thinking about for quite some time. So I thought, let's actually go through this. Uh, Kaichi said we should rename this stream to be K-pop. Yeah, Mark talks about K-pop stream. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's 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 talk about what we're going to do. Okay, so we want to talk about Comp three four two one graphics. So I've been tasked with um, teaching graphics in term three. Um, it's been gone for a year. It didn't go at all in twenty twenty, um, and I, I've also kind of well, it's not really I've been tasked to. I requested this. Because I've taught graphics, and it's the closest thing we have to um, being a games-related course. Um, and I, I really kind of love computer games, and I I understand that, like, in terms of, like, you know, the worldwide computing industry, we can't discount computer games because there's so much work happening in that. The only downside of the work happening in that, it's like, it's like, the music industry which we've been talking about for a great deal of the evening it's like um the fashion industry it's like tv all entertainment and things people love it so they want to get into it um people don't always love making i don't know apps for financial services and stuff like that so you tend to get um more people wanting to get into games and more people um willing to basically get paid shit all just to work in games i have i have people i've taught who got into games companies so one of my it's probably one of the best um students i ever taught who's he's now a friend of mine um 
kind of hotshot programmer, but not not super hotshot. You don't have to be a hotshot programmer, but just like one of those people, head screwed on right, knew how to think their way around what they wanted to do, so that they could they could do stuff well. Um, was getting paid forty k a year in in his first graduate job, and I was like, dude, that is like you could not quite but you could nearly legitimately go take shifts at mcdonald's and get 40k a year like you're being hideously devalued here and it was kind of like and he was like yeah but i'm 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 making games i'm making games that are gonna be released my friends are gonna play them and stuff and it's like yeah okay that's good you still getting shafted though and it was like it's, it's such it's such a tough call right people say chase your dreams um, and, and, and I think, yes, you should chase your dreams. Um, but, um, should also add, don't get shafted chasing your dreams because everywhere there are dreams being chased. There's some fuckwit who wants to take, take you for a ride because they will put something in front of you that, that looks like a dream, but all it is, is them screwing you and keeping all the money. And it's always tough, right? Because I, I never want... I never want to be, like, someone who's just chasing money. But I know that, like, whenever you're chasing your passion, there's always someone willing to not pay you properly and and, and sort of just pay you in the idea that you get to chase your passion. It's a tough call. I could argue that's where I am now. Um, Because teaching is, is, is so, so important to me. And... And I'm literally getting paid probably about 60 or 70% of what I would get paid if I just basically stepped out the door from UNSW and straight into one of the feeder companies. <laughs> like, you know, it's not like I haven't had conversations with people in Google at Atlassian and stuff like that over the years. And it's like, there would be jobs there if I wanted. And I would definitely get paid more than I get paid as a lecturer. So it's like, am I am I getting shafted or not? Or am I doing this because it's worth more than the money? Because what I'm doing is... Like, if I want to make the world a better place, then I shouldn't be caring too much about what my salary is. I'm getting enough. You know, I'm fine. I'm living very comfortably. Um, So chasing money at this point seems like a dumb idea. But um, when I consider what effect I have on, um, on the world of computing... I'm in a very small corner of it, but it's funny around UNSW. It's like, I'm still teaching more people than nearly anyone else in the whole university. (laughs) But, um, I have this weird, weird minor celebrity status around Kingsford. It's really odd, but you know, um, the, yeah, there's always this balance back and forth. You go, should I chase money or should I chase my dreams? And you go, when you chase your dreams, maybe you're going to chase less money, but maybe it's worth it. Maybe you're still doing things that are fulfilling you in life and maybe it's more important to be fulfilled um, than it is to have lots of money. I've seen plenty of people make lots of money and just kind of have a life they don't like. And, um, and it's like, yeah, that's going to be that's gonna be rough. You know, like I have down times because I get depressed about what I'm doing and stuff like that but imagine how much worse that would be if the work I was doing I considered was not for the good of humanity or for the good of the people around me or something like that that would just make it so much worse I feel anyway um okay let me go back to chat um Toaku you missed the K-pop discussion (laughs) um Chewie's asking, is there going to be any difference between this new iteration of Comp 3421 and the old one? I assume that there is going to be just because I haven't done the old one and I haven't seen the old one, so I have to teach from my experience of graphics rather than um, the course that was previously. So, yeah, there there has to be. There there will be some kind of differences, but I don't know what yet because I have to put it together. Maybe I should start talking about it. (laughs) Um... Saluk so said, love the Brian David Gilbert shout out. Wait, should did I shout out? I can't remember if I did or not. Anyway, Kaichi's saying I'm with chasing dreams, not money. So that's the thing, Kaichi. Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> Chase the dreams. 
But if they figure out that you're chasing dreams, not money, then they won't pay you. Um, make sure you still get enough, and make sure that in doing that, see, this is the this is the weird thing, right? Because if you go, I'm chasing dreams, not money. I've already got money. I don't need to get paid properly. What you end up doing is setting up a precedent so that other people around you don't get paid properly as well, and maybe they needed the money. Um, so even when we're okay with being devalued, what we might be doing is devaluing all the people around us who needed it more than us I never know it's really hard it's like this weird ethical kind of thing of like I think everyone should be paid properly but I also think chasing money is bullshit so I'm just like how do I you know I don't know I don't know how to <laughs> students tend to look for me for answers look to me for answers and I don't have them all <laughs> all I have is trade-offs it's like people go should I optimize my code and it's like well are you going to optimize for memory usage or or for CPU usage, because those are two different kinds of optimization. I don't know which one you're going to do. This is the same thing. I don't know what to optimize for. Um... <laughs> Vigrimia says, damn, I just joined, and we're talking about the good of humanity. <laughs> oh, the Brian David Gilbert thing was the guy who games while biking. Okay, okay, great, cool. <laughs> Honey on Lisa said no answers from Mark. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's now that we're an hour and twenty minutes in, let's get into the thing that I said I was gonna do from the beginning. <laughs> I would love it if this is how I taught graphics. Um I know that this is like not the way that people are used to learning at, at UNSW in 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 just university in general, but this is actually the way I prefer teaching. Like, I would prefer to have a lecture that goes for, like, four hours. Um, but it goes literally like what we're doing now. Um, what I do for the first hour is I just open up the room. And then I open us up to thinking about things. And, and just being relaxed and talking about things. And we can talk about K-pop. I can play you an album that I made years ago with friends and stuff. Um, and things like that. But it's not about... Um, not everything has to be this fucking fire hose of content into your brain that you're somehow expected to remember. I think that's bullshit, you know. But I also understand <laughs> that if you want to put, like, 50,000 students into an institution together, um, someone like me can't just go, oh, just give me CLB7 for a day. They'll be like, what? You don't have the right to take that resource away from other people. It's like, oh, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, I'm sorry. But let's... I'll do it quickly, I apologise. <laughs> you know, but I do love the idea that if I could just sit down with people and talk with them for a while, then you'd, you'd learn a lot. Because I think actually, like, you know, what I have been doing for the last hour or so is actually what teaching is. It's more about thinking about life and the world and, like, how you're how you're going to approach things and stuff and then when we're when we're chill and happy and our brains are kind of ticking over quite nicely then we can launch into content like this so having said that let us now launch into this jack is saying that game devs need unions yeah i think there is actually thinking towards getting towards that i still have my ear to the ground a lot of that stuff the igda and um igea in in Sydney in particular, friends of mine run that, so, like, I'm still connected to those. I'm actually, like, the, there's a IGDA, the um, International Game Developers Association, the Sydney Facebook group for that, I was actually one of the the, the founding moderators, like, like, if there was a little signature there, my, my name would be on it from the beginning of that. That was post the, the first game jams in Sydney, which was, like, we had them at the Powerhouse Museum and... 2010 I think was the first one um I went there as a uh, as a jammer and then afterwards helped helped run not really run them I was just assisting for the next couple of years and then I drifted off to do other things um Kaiji was saying yeah I'd love to have an online lecture that's four hours long but you were just chilling can't take Sylvie you can do it by I could do it by YouTube yeah but like imagine like if I did that um and and ti UNSW timetabling came to me and said you literally want to have like 12 contact hours with your students each week like their timetables will not survive this and I was like okay fine what else 
Um, but yeah, this is... I, I, I prefer this to teaching. I prefer being relaxed with the time and to talk about things. I used to do this teaching where it was like, um, you're full-time with your students. So I would be with my students for like seven hours in the day. So what that would be is like, in the morning before lunch, would be like this. We'd talk about things, um, and I'd have sort of three hours before we were going to go to lunch. So we would talk about things, and I would go through content, I would teach them something, and in the afternoon would be like the tutorial. So the tutorial goes for like three, four hours as well, where you, you go around, you talk to people, and you go, okay, so the stuff we're talking about in the morning, here are the questions, see how you can... You can do them and people have problems with them and I would talk about them and stuff like that. Michael's making fun of me. <laughs> slide one is love, slide one is life. Because <laughs> I've been on slide ones there. <laughs> okay. Hamish said, an optional one hour intro to the lecture that doesn't cover course content. That could be interesting. That could, that could be something to think about. Okay. Let's do this. <laughs> I love how like my two hour streams, they're never going to be two hour streams. We always know they're going to go over that. So, let's start the stream now. <laughs> Blake, this slide is taking longer than the slide assignment. Uh, Kaichi says, just don't tell you in SW timetable. I mean, if you look at that, I am a little bit subversive in that regard, in that I have timetabled stuff before that was optional content that clashed with some classes for people, so some had, people had to watch it after the time and stuff. Trey's like, we made it to slide two. Okay, slide two. So let's look at the history, because Comp 3421 existed way before um, I was a lecturer. So I took it at UNSW in, I think, 2002. Don't, don't quote me on this, because I can't remember. I remember what I was doing around those years. Um, it could have been 2003, but, you know, who knows. It was sometime around then. I took it from someone called Tim Lambert. I think Tim works at Google now. Tim, there was a downsizing at CSC, um, and he left to join the industry when that happened. Um, he was he was a kind of an inspiration to me because he um, he was a really interesting teacher. Um, thought about what he did. He was part of the cast of the first CSE review as a lecturer and I just loved that, that was really cool, I was playing in the band in CSE review at the time and we were just like, oh my god, we've got a lecturer uh, and I keep thinking maybe that would be a fun thing to do, is um, is go and, go and um, do stuff with CSE. I'm wearing a CSE review t-shirt at the moment, this is the, the last show they did, I think, no no this is one before the last, this is the 2018 t-shirt, I think um, yeah Shout out to Gal. He he got in contact with me before I was a lecturer, actually, to ask me about the history of CSE Review because he found out he found me from somewhere Facebook maybe. Okay, so I took in two thousand two. Obviously, what I learned in two thousand two is not going to come back, but some of it, strangely enough, is. So I need to think about how that's going to work, but I also need to look at how the course last ran in twenty nineteen and how I'm going to make it look the same. And I think that's the interesting thing is that because I don't have time to take that course again, it's not running again, I'm going to have to poke through the materials and see how it was taught and whether the focus is going to be the same. And and that's, I think that's difficult, right? So, so let's, 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 let's talk about what the course, I guess, should be. Um, is it's a computer graphics course, obviously. So we're talking about 2D, 3D graphics rendering on computers. Um, and so then we get this kind of questions like, okay, if we've got nine, 10 weeks, we're gonna go through this more in the slides because heaps of stuff about this. If I have nine, 10 weeks, how do I teach people about this whole thing? I don't think there's enough time to, to teach people about um, the entirety of computer graphics at this time. It's gonna have an intro, it's gonna have big gaps in it somewhere. Um, and so I need to figure out where those gaps are going to be. So I know that what we're teaching about is computer graphics, i.e. rendering of imagery on computers. If I, if I want to simplify it as much as I can, is this going to be a real time focus on things like games or were you talking pre-rendered imagery like movies and art and stuff? So when we're talking about games, we're talking about anything that can render in enough of a fraction of a second that we can put sequences of images after each other to make stuff look like it moves. 
Um, and so the average for that, I'm going to say about a hundred, a hundredth of a second, like acceptable, about a hundredth of a second. I mean, we'll accept less than that. We'll accept like a sixtieth. Um, I mean, hell, we spent, we spent a good sort of 10, 15 years in the middle of monitor technology where we went down to 60 and we accepted 60 FPS. We're back at 144 now. When we had CRT monitors, we were at 120 kind of thing. And so we expected that. And it's weird how LCD tech slowed us down for a while. But, you know, we lived with it. Um, and we're thankfully out of that now. So I'm happily back to, like, you know, playing most of my games at 100 frames a second or so. Um, but then are we thinking about that or are we thinking about movies? Uh, movies and art and stuff. Like, when we talk about, like, the pipeline for CG films or big VFX renders in films, you consider, like, all those superhero movies that that we love, like all the Marvel movies, um, heaps of that stuff is, um, is basically CG. So we're looking at, they average about eight minutes a frame. So it's not the kind of thing that we can see and do immediately, but it's different tech if it's going to do eight minutes a frame. And it's like eight minutes a frame on a, um, a shipping container full of computers rather than uh, one hundredth of a second in just one computer that we're using right then and there. So we use different techniques for those. I always laugh about the shipping container. I've literally, I've seen the shipping container at Animal Logic in Moore Park in Sydney. And it's like, wow, that's your render farm? It's like, yeah. The shipping container covered in air, air conditioners. That's the thing. And it's like, wow, that's so interesting. Jack said I missed the first slide. Can you go over it again? <laughs> Screw you, Jack. <laughs> I pay that guy. <laughs> um, Kaiji's asking, would we learn about how the GPU works? Yes, we would learn how the GPU works. So this is that kind of thing as well. Oh, Blake says I'm fine with 30. I guess you've been playing console games. <laughs> consoles are, consoles go much slower. I mean, movies got 24 frames a second still. And then they did um they did a Hobbit at 60 frames a second, and I can't believe I didn't go and watch it. Because I, I don't care even if the movie's good or bad. I want to see what a movie looks like at 60 FPS. Um, because we, those of us who game a lot of the time, we expect, you know, 60 is a minimum. And if it's anything less than that, we're like, oh, it's a bit janky. I can't react properly to things, you know? Whereas, like, movies are like that all the time. I remember seeing Spider-Man, I think, at IMAX. And it was just like, the screen was so big, and there was so much time between the frames, that you just saw these stills of Spider-Man swiping across the screen as he was swinging across, and it was like, oh, no amount of motion blur can cover that. Anyway, <laughs> Mother's Day, Mark on Monday. <laughs> Thank you, Skure. Um... <laughs> William H. Would we learn how to buy an RTX card in the current climate? No, what you need to do to buy an RTX card is to have already farmed a significant number of Ethereum <laughs> on all the graphics cards, then you can upgrade to your RTX because you're rolling in money. Anyway, so we're talking about this, like making imagery with code. So this is the computer science side of it. It's like not just like what are we showing, but like I should probably turn go into presentation mode. <laughs> How's that all going to work? And like, which tiny bit of it are we actually going to learn? There's a lot of maths behind it. And there's a lot of like, if we gloss over some of it, there's a lot of thinking about lighting and imagery and stuff. And if I wanted to, this could also be about like the idea of visual design and stuff like that. Like I actually could, could teach a lot about like, what is color and why does it make sense to people? you know, and it's like, just some weird stuff like that, which is like, what computer graphics is, like, I think I've got slides on this anyway, oh, I know, I'll talk about that in a second, but like slides are haphazard, usually what I would do when I make slides is I would make a bunch of slides and I shift them around so that they flow with what I want to say, this, I haven't done that with this, so I'll just follow them and see where we go. Um... Ranjit <laughs> says, provide an RTX 3080 for every 3421 student. I wish I could. I wish that we could have, like, a lab on campus that had a graphics card in every computer. Um, and I know people are going to get the shits with me for saying this, but it also was running Windows so that I could actually run, like... I could have just Steam on all of these and, and run games on them and stuff like that and, and have it so that um, 
I could teach graphics and say, look, if you don't have your own gaming machine, these are here. Because you need, basically, you need a gaming rig to be able to see everything that um, that I would want to do with graphics. And I think that's a downside. So that's going to be a big limiting factor in the course. It's like, what can I ask people to do technically if they don't have enough hardware to do it? It's going to be interesting. The questions are on the slides actually later. Anyway, okay, so, so what's my goal? All we're going to do is we're going to think about this like um, it's an engineering problem. And so I've taught everyone about problem solving. Anyone who's done 1511 already should already, um, um, should already understand that the, the, the way that we approach any kind of development of something is we go, what is our goal? We have to think about what our end goal is for this course, and then we have to think about how we fiddle with things to make things work to actually reach that goal. So that's what we're going for here, right? So the first thing we need to think about is like, what is the goal? So I've got two things I need to think about, and I've split them into front end and back end. So it's like, this is like totally, right? Like those of you like who've done a fair bit of software development and stuff, it's like, oh, he's, he's pulling apart the creation of a course into a software project. So I'm basically, I've gone full like program manager here, like where I'm just like, this is, this is what a project manager does at the beginning of a um, beginning of software project as we start to think about, okay, how are we going to do these things? Uh, what do we need to get done? And then how do we actually make it happen? Um, Jack is saying, what's the reason the course didn't run in 2020? Um, the, the lecturer who'd been taking it up to then, uh, Rob, uh, left CSE for doing some other stuff. I can't remember what he was doing. And then um, I think the pandemic hit and he had to come back, but by then it wasn't scheduled. I can't remember. I will talk to him about it. That's on my list of things here. I'm just like stuff I need to do is actually talk to Rob. Um, because I think before I, this is actually like is still really early days before, because I've been so busy with 1511. Um, before I start creating any content is I should talk to him and see like, if you could start this again from scratch, what would you do? Um, so I will obviously be talking to him before I lock anything down. Um, but anyway, so front-end student experience. So this is like how we present to you. And so you know this, right? This is like how I want you to feel about something. But what do I want you, people to feel? What do I want people to feel about graphics? And what do I want them to be able to do? So those are like two very different things. One is like, do I want them to get an understanding of how this stuff works? Um, and do I want to do that through kind of um, having you build the things. And so you understand like, what does a surface normal do to a lighting algorithm? You know, um, what's the difference between lighting in, um, lighting per lights in the scene versus a deferred rendering technique for lighting and stuff. It's like, all this stuff is like, these are just buzzwords. No one knows this. And it's like, okay, what do I, which bits do I want to teach? And it's like this technical kind of shopping list of things where I'm like, the need to know all these things to reach this end point. And it's like, where's the end point? If this is an intro course, which it kind of has to be, then the end point can't be a single technique. It has to be like this breadth of things that people could then look at later. I would love it. I mean, people have asked me about this. Um, Shrey, Rob, as in Rob Clifton Everest. Yes, I'm pretty sure it was him. Um, yeah, and I think he wasn't around for most of 2020. I think he got he got called back in at some point because he as he found out he was free. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And Jack said you had Rob for one five three one in twenty twenty. So I think that was yeah, that was that was kind of yeah. So are you Brendan saying three four? It's an entry course. Yeah, I mean yes, and and no, right. It's an entry level course, but it's also a third year course. I'm expecting people to be like sufficiently educated that I can throw shit at you and then you have to make it work. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the 1511 where I'm just like, oh, look at this beautiful kind of ramping up of the knowledge and stuff. And heaps of people who knew about programming already were like, okay, I know that, I know that, I know that. Let me hit the challenges. But other people were like, whoa, whoa, I can make this stuff work. Graphics is not going to be like that. <laughs> Graphics is like, I assume that you're educated now. I assume that as a third year subject, you are one step from, you know, getting an internship and or going out for a full-time job. Um, so if you're in that position, then I expect you to be able to work. So again, I'm going to talk about this later, but I was thinking of like the first assignment of just going, get your stuff set up. And you'd be like, how? So I'm not going to tell you how, just get your stuff set up. 
Like, what ID do you use? <laughs> you don't have to copy me. I will do it all as well. So if you want to copy me, you can copy me. But if you don't want to copy me, then I just expect to see results. You know, that's what, that's what being a professional is. I'm not going to tell you how to set up your own computer. I'm going to let you set up your computer your way. But if you don't do it the way I do it, I'm not going to help you. So it's like, it's this weird kind of thing. I'm not going to be like, use whatever language you want. This is just totally open because that's going to just, oh, we're going to be in so much trouble if I do that, right? Um, but yeah, Australia was like comp 3231 assignment zero vibes. Was there an assignment zero? Yeah. Jack was saying there's no further graphics course, right? So this has to cover a lot. There used to be an advanced graphics course. The person who taught me, Tim Lambert, did an advanced graphics course. And it was really cool because it was just like, here we go. Do what you want. You do one project over the whole term and we will teach you about all these weird techniques. So that's where I learned about inverse kinematics. And, um, and so inverse kinematics is like, okay, so this is the idea of like animating a multi-jointed limb to do things and stuff. And so you can have this thing where it's like, this point must reach somewhere. How do you backwards back propagate where all the joints should be to reach that when these joints aren't physically connected and they don't stretch themselves towards stuff and things? How do you calculate that? And we hit a point where Tim was talking about mapping uh, a five dimensional space onto a four dimensional space so that you can understand it better. And I was just like, <clears throat> all right, I'm done, Tim. I'm never going to learn that because he was a mathematician he did graphics he, he actually understood all the theoretical maths uh whereas i'm like i'm like a gamer who wants to understand understand graphics so i'm just like i want to get this working but i do not understand the entirety of the theoretical maths behind multi-jointed limb animation so it's never going to happen um so yeah it'd be interesting if i tried to do an advanced graphics course it would probably if i did like an advanced course like that i would probably more likely to be doing something like saying all right, we're going to have a functional real-time game by the end of this course. Um, I will teach you the things that you, the ideas you need to get there, but you're going to have to implement it. Like that would be what I would want to do with an advanced course. But then what I would want to teach people about is um, production. And this is something that you learn elsewhere in computer science anyway. So you don't really need me to teach you that, but I would love to teach people about, okay, build it, test it, rebuild it, test it, you know, like, why is this thing going like this? And we start to bring in game design and stuff like that. And so it would be like, if you've done HCI, then you understand a bit about game design, right? Because you understand that the entirety of the purpose of games is human entertainment. So if it doesn't entertain people, it doesn't matter how good your code is. It's shit. <laughs> Sorry. A bit excessive there. But it is. <laughs> you know. Anyway. Oh, hi, Wendy. Chicken's checking in. Everyone, just just to, cause cause we were we were talking about uh, K-pop and how every every um, K-pop group has a name for their fandom. So like um, Blackpink has Blinks, BTS has Army, uh, Mamamoo has their Moomoo's, uh, Stray Kids, who are still listening to. If you're still on the same playlist, I am um, have their stays, um, and and Mark Chi has the Cheekins. <laughs> This was made up by by Wendy, right? This is your idea, wasn't it? And it was like, um, yeah, it was like this this funny joke that we had that um, that I had a um, I I have my own fan club, which I don't think I do. But I mean, there's people here now, so thank you for for coming on and listening. Anyway, <laughs> Wendy's like, I don't follow any K-pop idols except Mark G. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> There's actually... When did you said please join Chica? Is there, is there some kind of group somewhere? That'd be so funny. I need everyone to learn a fan chant as well, so that when I start each lecture, I just hear like this... Da, 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 ba, 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 da, 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 coming out of the, like, the thousands and thousands of audience and stuff. <laughs> oh, Michael, how's it going? When's the next album dropping? Um, maybe not for some time. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Anyway, anyway, okay. Okay, so back to, back to what we're talking about here, right? So... This is the experience that I want people to have. And you know, you know, I put a lot of effort into this because uh, pretty much everyone here has done 1511 with me. So you know that I spent a lot of time thinking about how I want people to feel by the end of the course. So the course has a dramatic structure to do this. See, hidden benefits of having a lecturer who, who is basically a, a, a professional theatre production manager for 
for a couple of years is like you've actually got someone who understands what a dramatic arc is um and i think plenty of other lecturers do understand that there's that but they may have not had like the hands-on training um so yeah how do i where do i want to bring people to because education is a journey right i take you along a journey but you're the ones walking the actual journey so how do i get you to walk that journey to end up somewhere where i want you to be which is like you know like if you've done 1511 you know that where i want you to be is like um reasonably technically proficient but not even that i don't i don't have the the bar for technical proficiency i i don't personally think it needs to be that high um it needs to be at a minimum level to continue on to other courses though that's really where the bar is um but the thing that's most important is what is your attitude towards it at the end so either you have a great passion for it or at least you've learned that you don't and you go okay maybe not you know um and that's the goal is is to to generate that passion um <laughs> blake mark chief fan art <laughs> auto tune album Ooh, i dropped from chat for a second but i appear to be back <laughs> Abra, I'm, I'm 105 minutes late but we're only four slides in that's good to know <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay so there's that kind of thing and there's like what do i want people to actually be able to do it's like i want you to be able to work with OpenGL. i want you to, be able to write some shaders i want you to be able to understand how a lighting algorithm works and stuff like that but i'm just like if i only do those three things then we're still in the 1990s i mean if we're shaders we're in the 2000s but i mean still like we're old it's like old tech it's like how can i be teaching you about stuff that's so old and it's like oh well you know i thought you see <laughs> c's older than me but even then, I taught you C in a modern way. Didn't teach you to program C the way that we used to program C. So, it's like graphics. It's like, can I get you up to date? And the answer is definitely no. I am not getting you to ray tracing. I apologize. I wanted to. I, I, and so I, 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 I held back from ray tracing. I said, can I get you to deferred rendering? And I was like, oh, I totally can't. I can tell you about it. It's going to be like, you know how like I taught recursion in... Um, uh, in 1511, I think um, deferred rendering is going to be recur the recursion of COM3421. I'm going to teach you all this stuff. I'm going to teach you how to do lighting algorithms and stuff so that you can get stuff to look like it exists in a, a real world. It's not real. It's all a trick. It's not real. But if I do... Um, uh, if I get to the end, I can go, okay, now we flip the whole thing on its head and you do it all in reverse. And everyone's going to be like, what? Why? Why? Oh my god. Oh, what's happening? And I'll be like, yep. And that's the way it actually works. So that's what deferred rendering is. Um, so it's quite interesting. <laughs> Abra, don't worry, slide one has been on my YouTube homepage for the past few days because of the thumbnail. I've examined it very closely. <laughs> uh, Runching saying, what about real-time rendering? Yeah, we will definitely do that. We will do all the basics of real-time rendering. Um, but we won't do all of it because we can't. I do want to do some post-processing, but like in the middle of like training, wanting to do post-processing, there's all this other stuff I need to do. I need to teach you about like what is visible. So frustrum, which is the the viewpoint of the virtual camera when we're rendering stuff, and then how do you decide which bits of the scene you're going to render? Because you might be in a massive scene with all this stuff, right? That stuff's really important, um, necessary stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's like technically, how far am I going to get? And this is like the back end stuff. So we're thinking about this. It's like, how does it, how's the course actually going to, how am I going to teach this stuff? What APIs and languages are we going to use? Like, we're obviously using OpenGL. Well, not obviously. I mean, I could use Vulkan or DirectX, but um, I'm not going to because A, they're, they're proprietary systems, and B, I don't know them. It's like, there are limitations. The funniest thing is like limitations. Like people go well, like, so what's the best way a lecturer is going to teach something? Well, the first thing the lecturer needs to do is know what they're teaching. Because uh, if you don't know what you're teaching, it's going to be harder. Because you inevitably, as a teacher, at some point, inevitably as a teacher, you wing it. Right? You have to wing something. You have to just make it up on the fly and be like, oh, it's probably going to work. And it's probably better when you're making stuff up on the fly that you've done it before. <laughs> so that's why it's most likely going to be an OpenGL. I this language question is a really big issue and this is going to be a back and forth question i think it's in a later slide anyway i need to think about staff and course infrastructure as well i can't just grab the staff that taught it um uh in 2020 because it didn't happen in 2020 right so because it didn't happen in 2020 i don't necessarily have a great number of potential staff members uh for this course and i'm going to need some tutors um 
I have considered just doing all the tutorials like this as like this big open-ended workshoppy kind of thing but that's not very good I need people answering questions in small groups I need people getting to know their students so they can teach them um, the course at the moment is limited at about 250 people and I'm not going to tutor all 250 people I might take one of the tutorials I think if I'm if I'm sort of rehashing tutorial contents or rebuilding tutorial content from um from the last from previous content stuff like that i need to actually take a tutorial to see whether it works or not because i'll be editing them on the fly for the next iteration of the course that kind of thing but yeah so i need to figure this out i have one or two people who have approached me saying they're like yeah i know this stuff i can help you teach it and stuff so hopefully i've got one or two um i'm also not looking forward to um having to run course infrastructure um, Tom's here now. Tom runs all the cost infrastructure on my behalf for 1511, which is good because 1511 is way too big. It's a monstrous beast. Um, and one person running a course of that size is just like that. I can't imagine uh, a harder job at a university of trying to run like a 900 person course for a first year in at a first year introductory level without help um, because you need to provide a lot of framework for first year students whereas for third year students i'm being like framework i give you theory you give me framework you know <laughs> so so it's different but i still i'm still a little bit um uh, scared of having to do this because i'm not a subject admin i'm not a systems admin either i did work as a sysadmin at one point in my career i took it off my resume so that no one would ever hire <laughs> hire me for it again it's like mark why is this six months gap in your resume it's like because i will not build mail servers for you again i was not good at it and i should not be asked to do it again <laughs> anyway so let's um in the same way that we would do any other kind of decision making, this is an engineering problem, we sm split the problem up into smaller parts and we think about how we're going to make decisions on what we're going to teach. So what I'm doing today really is like this kind of overall idea of, um, of how to put a course together. So you can see this and it's like, you can see how, how lecturers do this. And so I'm doing it from a very, very engineering way. And I think that makes sense because I am an engineer and, um, and I've solved problems using this process before. So funnily enough, this is also the way that we would go about things when we're trying to put together a, um, a show. When we're putting, in, putting together a theater show, we'd also be like, okay, these are the things we want to teach. These are the things we want to tell. This is the, how the story goes. How do we actually put all the scenes together to make this work? So it's a similar kind of thing. Um, just going back over chat. Tai Chi was saying, yeah, pretty sure Mark was like, if we let them choose a language, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, yeah, so it depends on marking, but the interesting thing that we will potentially do with graphics for marking is the whole point of graphics is to trick the human eye. So I don't actually need to know how you did it in the back end. I will just look at what you're actually rendering and I will mark you on what you're rendering. So if it looks like what you're rendering did not have bump mapping in it, then I will say that you are rendering only with one or two textures and you are not doing the full diffuse lighting rendering part. Like I was, I will look for the evidence of the outcome rather than the, um, so there's not going to be any like auto testing and like maybe they won't even be looking at your code, but I, just, I don't think I can, I don't think I can sign off on people's code without looking at it. Um, but I'll decide these things later. That is, those are, those are details that are, this is way too detailed for now. Now is thinking about how we, how do we hit the big goals? So we need to like zoom out for the moment and think about things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of discussion there. <laughs> Great. Shrey and Tom are having an argument again. <laughs> if anyone knows these two, there's like, this is just what happens if they get put in the same place. Anyway. Um, so back to actually thinking about um, how we're going to do this so we have to measure every decision we make against the original goals and the original goals are what do we want them to feel what do we want them to know and these are still moving goalposts because i haven't locked these down yet i know how i want people to feel about this i want them to feel about how amazing it is that we can turn a bunch of numbers into imagination 
I know that's what I want people to feel at the end. Um, but ironically, that's the, for me, that's the easiest part of this. For most people lecturing, I think this is one of the hardest things. Um, because to have this question answered is you have to have, you know, some experience as a storyteller, I guess. Um, and heaps of people, I think, um, educating, we, we have more experience with this. You know, what, what technically do we want them to be able to? What content are we going to deliver? Not what feelings we are going to impart into people. But what we're going to realize a lot is that both of these are just as important because if you don't give people the right feelings about things, then they will not bother to pick up any of this knowledge that you're trying to do. I like to give people the feelings and sneak in the knowledge. Uh, other people often do it the other way around. Um, and you, you see, like, the difference. You see the different approach from different people where it's like, this is what you need to know. And the context under which you need to know it is this, right? Whereas I'm like, this is this wonderful world and this is how we build it. Um, so that's just my approach to things. I don't know if it's always the right approach. Huh. Because if you get too caught up in this, then you forget that this stuff actually needs to be built and then you don't build anything. <laughs> which is, like, my life. <laughs> okay, so... Um... What's going on? Oh, I just know my, 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 my chat is now full of, 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 of Tom and Shrey. So I'll just, I'll just let you keep going, I guess. Or not. <laughs> we'll see how we go. We'll see what I, are there other people talking? Um, <laughs> Abraham, yes, I need a RTX 3090 for my uni course. Thanks for the birthday present. Mom. Yeah, so that's another question, but I'm going to talk about that when I talk about it. <laughs> Not, <laughs> and I'm just going to follow chat for everything. Okay, so everything we do has to be measured against the original goals, but we have other constraints. So we have the UNSW 10-week course structure. So I have a decent idea about how much I can shove into people's brains in 10 weeks, um, and the answer is not much, right? So I've got to be careful about that. Um, I need to think about the technical ability students have before the course, and do I fiddle around with the prereqs? Um, fiddling around with the prereqs is a very bad idea now, because heaps of people are already enrolled. So I doubt I can add a prereq, um, but maybe for the next iteration of the course I can decide that people needed something. And also, this is the big one, how much fatigue can students handle? I think we've hit the end of Stray Kids, because I'm now getting something else. I'm getting TXT. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next album of Stray Kids. It's going to go live. All right. So if you're following me for the music right now, we're going to the next Stray Kids album. We're going to play that. Anyway. So, yeah. We need to fit stuff into the 10-week course structure, which means that when I start picking topics and picking lectures and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to teach first. This is what I want people to be able to do for the first assignment, second assignment, third assignment. I don't know. You know, I need to figure out, will I have taught them enough by that point to do that? So eh, it's tough. Um, but also, can I give people a, a ramp up, a break and another ramp up? Um, I still don't know how successful we are at 1511 of doing that. I think 1511 is like a slow ramp and then a sharp ramp. Um, and there's no good break in the middle. But I can't figure out what to remove to give people some space to breathe. So it's just kind of like, I think you have to take your break in between terms nowadays. Um, and the short 10 week thing makes it kind of possible to, to keep up your effort all the way through 10 weeks and then take some time off and then do it again for 10 weeks. I don't know about the third 10 week, the third 10 week push I find very difficult personally. Um, and I'm sure students do as well. So, you know, yeah, Blake's saying, yeah, the point of structs, think this is a big ramp up. Yeah. Um, Nick's saying, yeah, open jail is decent. C++ for best speeds. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to do this as like a... Um, if people wanted to get jobs doing graphics, then I'd have to do it in C++. But if I'm thinking about this not as like a vocational training thing, but as like a... You want to learn about the whole idea of this thing, then it doesn't matter as much what language you're doing it in. You know? Um, especially because most of the people who are working on graphics are not actually doing that kind of back-end stuff. Like, we, we defer the back-end work 
to something like the Unreal Engine. And what we do is we put our stuff in it. So it's a, it's a different kind of thing. But, eh, I don't know. So all, all the conversation that we're having in there, which is about um, the nitty gritty of things, I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet. Um, I have to set out the goals of the course and the overall ideas of the course first and then I will I won't I won't dive into any of the details until after I've um I figured out whether I can meet those goals with other things you know that's the that's that's the way we should do this right because the goal is to get people educated and then everything flows backwards from that goal we don't we don't go picking languages until we've really clarified that goal and how this kind of 10 week educational structure happens and then all the support structures go in so the front end is first this is weird right because we don't always do that when we're making software is often the back end comes first and the front end is some interface to that back end but this is going to be the other way around where it's like what do i want people to know at the end what do i want people to feel at the end the back end must then support that so we'll see where we go with that so yeah this is that question kind of like we have to balance back and forth between the theory and the practice so the theory is like what am i going to teach you about cool things that can happen and stuff and versus what am i going to what are you going to actually be able to make at the end of the course so it's like at the end of the course what are you going to be able to talk about versus what are you going to be able to make and that's that's always this thing like some university courses are really about thinking about things um and the the practicality is not as um not as deep or anything but i think graphics is very practical um i think it's very much about making the pixels change color on the screen and i think that's the importance of it so like if i can teach you how to make the pixels change color correctly on the screen then that will be the um the that'll be something that's useful <laughs> it's literally all you do in graphics is make the pixels change color there's nothing else happening <laughs> there's a whole bunch of back end but you know so yeah any course has to balance between it's nearly like when the course finishes what could you talk about versus what could you make and i need to balance so that you can do both of those things so this is also a future thinking thing if i teach you something that's useful right now but in the near near future might be useless um you could get some you could get cool, some cool stuff made so that was that would be like if i took you through a um a unity demo and at the end of the unity demo you'd have this scene that looked really nice and you'd be using all of this graphic stuff um but the second unity gets deprecated your your knowledge there is kind of useless right maybe from that knowledge you could sort of reverse engineer and be able to use whatever comes next in the in the in the sequence of tools in the future that people use or do i teach you something that's interesting and is not useful um and it doesn't get you any practical capability right now but in a few years time you'll be like hmm if i apply that theory that mark taught me to this then i could get this thing to look interesting and it's like yeah okay um it's all very nice and well to to talk about these kinds of theoretical possible ideas but if you can't use it and do anything with it right now are you actually going to remember it in a few years time and that's why both of these things are bad and both of them are good right so it's like do i teach you color theory it's like a nearly purely artistic concept do i teach you about game development it's like are those things close enough to graphics for us to really want to get involved with them or do i teach teach you like you know the the the, the deep only like rendering techniques shader code um do i teach you how to build your own 3d engine note that <laughs> nearly every company that made their own 3d engine has gone out of business id had to id i guess had to get bought by bethesda um unreal did okay i mean they, they don't own their own company anymore i think they're owned by tencent now um unity might be the only one because they never tried to make their own 3d engine and a game at the same time um crytek went under uh who else i'm i'm, I'm just thinking pretty much all of the um um all of the companies that built their own 3d engines in order to use in their own games ended up having to try to sell it on and ended up basically going under so 
Um, it's kind of like if I tell you that the best thing you could do is write your own 3D rendering engine, um, that might be just like just putting the first coffin, the, the, the first nail in the coffin of your, your future uh, commercial <laughs> concerns or whatever. But, you know, it's still really cool to learn about that stuff. It's still really cool to build a renderer from scratch. And I think that's still like whether or not it's useful, whether or not it's like commercially viable, is not super important to me because I think what you want to do is you want to learn about these things even if you're never going to do them. So there's always this back and forth, right? So we'll see. We'll see how they're, they're going. Oh, Blake says Nintendo does their own engines. That's true. Nintendo has done some really cool stuff with cell shading and stuff like that as well. So I think Nintendo sits separately in, 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 in all game industry stuff. I think Nintendo has been able to weather a lot of the storms and I think it doesn't get caught up in trying to think of a polite way to say it so i'm not every time i'm trying to think of a polite way of saying something i should just say it it doesn't get caught up in the stupidity of american marketing uh, which nearly every game made both in america and europe gets caught up in the stupidity of american marketing um, whereas nintendo seems to be in its own kind of immune bubble from it and just goes no nah, we, we do our thing it's kind of like you know you get your your Pixar, DreamWorks, and stuff, and their like specific marketing cycle of how they do things and stuff, and then you get someone like Studio Ghibli who's like, "No, don't care. We're just gonna do these things in our very, very particularly culturally different way, and we'll be just as successful." Um, so I think that's where Nintendo sits. So it's very, very weird and interesting. So they probably don't have a lot of the um, don't have a lot of the same issues that I I often talk about because I'm obviously. Um, more versed in what's happening in the American games. I'm, I say American in quotes because it's only it's only selling to America. Most of it's being made in Europe. Most of the best stuff's been made, being made in Europe at the moment. Anyway, um, so looks are saying we don't talk enough about how Valve is a games company from outer space. Yeah, I think Valve is super interesting because they're just like, you know what? How about we don't make games anymore and we sell everyone else's games? And we just take a little cut. It's not even that little. It's a pretty big cut of everyone else's games. Um, and they're like, oh, we don't have to make our own games. And people are like, but you are but you make you make the best games. You make better games than 99% than of the other companies in the world. Why did you stop making games? And they're like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's good. And they go, oh, we'll, we'll release, we'll, we'll just make this little toy game and release it. So they go, we'll, we'll make this thing in VR. So Half-Life Alex, And then people play it and they just go, oh. I wish you were still making games all the time because, like, what you do is so amazing. It's so, it's so funny. I think Valve is so funny like that. It's just like, what are you doing with all those amazing game developers? They're just, like, sitting in the background there while you just, like, churn the, the crank handle on your money printing machine that is Steam. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 exactly. So, looks as you're saying, exactly. Don't call it a toy game. It's amazing. Yeah, I know. Right. No, this was me saying, like, that's what they said. Because <laughs> they're just like, it's more of like a, it's like a VR demo thing. It's like, God, it's not a VR demo. It's like, it's like, it's like a revolution. <laughs> like, like, how could you talk yourselves down that much? Anyway. Yeah. So, like, instead of doing, like, the big releases, like Half-Life 3, they, they would only be doing these little things. And it's just like, oh, my God, you're, you're still, like... The people that you, you, you made you made this and like these people have not had like the, the regular kind of like cycle of like, you know, training and developing games and stuff like that. They've just been kind of sitting idle for a long time. And they make this thing and it's amazing. And it's like, oh wow. You haven't forgotten all of the all of the lessons. So Half Life Two We're on a tangent here, but you love my tangents, so I'm gonna do it anyway. If you ever play Half-Life 2, you go back and play it again. My my suggestion is um, play Half-Life 2 with the developer's commentary on. Because even that, they did it in such an amazing way. They have 3D objects in the scenes. And you go in the scene and you click on the 3D object. And then an audio bite plays. And they tell you about what they were thinking of in this scene and stuff like that. Um, and so they, um, it's really, really interesting. Because they talk about how they designed it. And there's so much brilliance in Half-Life 2 in taking what by then, Half-Life 2, I think was pretty, like kind of an aging genre, the first-person shooter by then, but they built such amazing atmosphere into it and none of it overt, you know, you just absorb it by being in the world. 
it's just like it's kind of like it's hard to it's hard to talk about it because it's just so pivotal to what makes games sort of what they are nowadays like subliminal storytelling and it's just amazing stuff anyway go back and check it out if you want to it's really good um <laughs> hey Mitchell saying Valve has a culture where you work on what you want to so people come and go from projects probably why they haven't done giant things in recent years oh right so Half-Life Alex was like they, they tried to bring everyone back together to work on it for a bit and Tyler McVicker's videos are very good so looks are saying to um to to get a look at what they've been doing <laughs> after nine years in development hopefully it'll be worth the wait that reminds me of overwatch when blizzard first released it it was like well this was an entirely different game that we had to scrap and then we we came back and turned it into something else and then overwatch kind of took over the world for a year or so like it was it was so big um anyway okay so yeah this is this back and forth do I teach you about the idea of how things work, or do I teach you about the concrete of how things work? If I teach everything about the concrete of how things work, uh, we won't have time to see everything. If I teach you about some ideas about how things work, then some of the things will be covered deeper than others. You know, so we'll we'll see that. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. So so there's a lot of like, and this is where we go. We go deep, and now we start thinking about okay, what's the topic structure for nine weeks? Um, how do I, um, how do I set out what happens each week so that you can get enough information in to be able to use that information? What are we doing for interactive teaching? It can't just be a lecture series. If it's a lecture series, it's not a subject. So tutorials, workshops, what? I don't know. Um, I assume there's definitely going to be tutorials with tutors. I need places where students can ask questions, um, and get even stuff like debugging help and things like that. They're going to be very different from your Comp 1511 tutorials. Your Comp 1511 tutorials go on a particular theory. Um, and that theory is that you tell something, someone something once. Um, if you tell something something... Some, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm tongue-tying myself. You tell someone something once, then they will hear it. They may not understand it, but they will hear it. Uh, you tell someone... Um, uh, what was it? <laughs> Stephen, why are you using the same format as lectures? Make it cooler. <laughs> I, I apologize. I actually did this as, as kind of a half joke because I was like, why am I doing lecture slides on my stream? I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw them in in exactly the same template as COM1511 to make it funny. I was thinking of just switching the theme to something else. I could actually just switch it without, um, wait, where is it? There you go. Now we're in a, d oh, I don't, I don't know if I like that one. I like this one. See, I've already gone through all of these. I don't like this one because it's not very readable. I don't like that font. Ooh, I don't like that font either. See, now everyone can get angry at Stephen because you, 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 you cause attention. Oh, where's the memes? I, t I said this at the beginning that I didn't really have time to, to, to lay this out the way I would. So there aren't, aren't memes or anything like that. So yeah, this is why I use this particular Google Slides template because I think it's one of the cleanest ones. It's not perfect, um, but it's one of the cleanest ones. <laughs> so let's, don't change it back. I don't like change. <laughs> uh... <laughs> And everyone's like, Izzy was like, no, I like Comp 1511 nostalgia. Yeah. Um, anyway, anyway. So, what is this structure? And I obviously I'm not going to go through this now. We don't have time now. This would take hours. Um, but yeah, there are things that I need to do. And then I also need to set out an, an assignment schedule. So, like, are we doing two assignments or three assignments? Like, usually subjects are going to have, like, three assessments in a sense. So... It'll be like um, two assignments and an exam. I have to figure out if I'm allowed to set an assignment that's due in the exam period because I don't think I am, in which case I probably can't do three unless one of the others is really small because you only got 10 weeks of work 
you're really only doing two phases of teaching like weeks one to five then weeks seven to nine i guess that's a short one but yeah and like the exams like fuck i hate exams <laughs> the shit for you and the shit for me um <laughs> it's past 10 p.m i can say what i want now uh, <laughs> uh what was this saying Ooh, still looks the same deus ex i've been meaning to play through the um the sequel well, no prequel to deus ex because i bought it like you know 20 years ago whatever when it came out and then i still haven't played it uh, i played halfway through it and then went back and stuff like that um yeah so like i don't know yes maybe we could have an exam if i thought we needed it if i felt like we couldn't assess people accurately otherwise um but i would prefer to have like an open-ended assignment where people can do what they want with it and it's interesting because you can do cool stuff like this with graphics where it's like i think one of the biggest problems with assignments um and one of the reasons why we need exams well in the past now it's like completely doesn't work the same way it's like uh, it's really easy to catch people cheating if they all their assignments are amazing and their exam is is, is crap and you're just going so this technique that you showed you could do at very advanced levels in the assignment you can't even do the basic version of it in the exam so you never did it yourself right and then people usually like oh yeah i guess so like it's like yeah like what use are you then if you if you just cheated the whole way through the course and you can't you didn't actually learn anything what's what's the point of doing this right and so that's why an exam is sometimes really useful but like if you the exams online people just cheat on the exam as well it's just like oh well what have we what have we achieved here all we've done is taken the students who are good at things and the students who care about what they're doing and we've put them through an exam which is a psychologically damaging experience that i don't like putting people through so um if it's all on if it's all going to be online assessments then maybe um I'll just do another assignment instead of an exam. Um, but what I want to do is something like much more open-ended, like a graphics assessment, where it's like you have to implement graphics techniques uh, and you have to show me which techniques you've implemented. And if I look at the output of your thing and it looks the same as someone else's, then you obviously cheated because how could you possibly make something where I say this is open-ended I didn't tell you what to use or something like that and both of you have imported exactly the same 3d model put it in exactly the same environment and your lights are in exactly the same places like how could you possibly have done this and it's just like <laughs> well you two are screwed aren't you yeah you know so it's like it's, it's that kind of thing where if i'm judging graphics based on like what it looks like to my eyes it's really easy to see when two people have done the same thing um yeah so maybe that kind of thing who knows yeah what are we talking about now we're talking about um super fx are we talking about old school um what's more call it uh old school consoles and stuff like that easy you're saying you sort of enjoyed the 1511 exam although it didn't get as far as you wanted yeah i think that's everyone <laughs> everyone feels like that 1511 exam people come out and go i love that course but man you you know how to set like a really punishing exam and it's like i i apologize but i i had no intention of the majority of you finishing that it was not it wasn't like the assignment the assignment i had the intention of the majority of you finishing something something significant you know the rest of the exam is like nah this is just a rank you all i'm not going to give out the ranks i think i think that's damaging to a community to give out ranks but um internally like i need to separate everyone so that I can say you are you're exactly this capable, um, but yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see where we go with that. Um, it's unlikely that I'm going to put an exam in it, because um, again, there's this other thing of like I got to deliver this thing. I got to deliver this thing in term three. I hate term three. Um, I studied at UNSW when there were only two terms. Now there's three terms, and I don't have enough energy for a third term in a year. So. If I don't have that energy, am I going to be able to write an exam for that? And also, am I going to be able to mark that at the end of the year? And I'm just like, nah. So some of these decisions are made based on the educational um, uh, the educational goals, but also, like, am I actually able to make this thing work? So if I can't make it work, then I'm not going to teach it. So if I can't, like, if I'm not confident 
in, in creating an exam that's going to do the job, then I am more confident in creating an assignment to do the job because the assignment is just project work. Project work is stuff that I've done in the real world. And like, I can do that, you know? So we'll see how we're going to do that. I have ideas about how I'm actually going to do assignments as well, but we'll think about that later. So yeah, then we start to um, think about nine weeks so it's you know 10 weeks but how how can far, far could we get in nine weeks and so we're going into the details now and the, the answer is not far enough so this is an intro course right and i said this before that it was going to end up being an intro course so i'm like what are we going to be able to do so i was like looking at like the eras of graphical technology being built i was like okay so 90s so if we just only do stuff in the 1990s maybe this is the first half of the course um changing the color of pixels the fundamental idea of graphics is pixels on the screen you change the color of the pixels our imagination fills in the rest right so that's that's it i guess when you come comes down to it just, just change the right pixels to the right colors and then you will pass this course <laughs> i always make this joke about comp 1511 it's just write the correct code all you need to do is write the correct code and submit it and then you've you've got 100 percent in the course it's it's easy just write the right thing and submit it <laughs> uh this is why um i was a very disruptive student <laughs> i find it deeply ironic that i was like a very disruptive student i ended up being a teacher but it also makes sense i think <laughs> um Kaichi's saying, if I have no exam, then I might now make that assignment due during the exam period. And Tom's correcting that. So um, we're, we're seeing people who are quite experienced, including one very experienced subject admin, saying that this is like, um, this is quite possible. So yeah, this is cool. Okay. Um, so this stuff is like the basics. This is, this is stuff you kind of need to understand if you want to know how graphics grew into other things. Basic polygon rendering. So we're talking... What am I, what am I, what am I thinking? I'm thinking 1992, 93, um, was when this stuff went out into the public. It was, it was, it was around earlier than that, but, um, we are, um, we will regularly, I think in the graphics course, be praying at the shrine of John Carmack. And I think it's quite funny because dude's still alive, but we're still going to pray at the shrine of John Carmack, um, who is id software right um doom quake all the way through to quake 3 i mean he's still with id now because he went oh no he went to oculus um but i think that yeah his like i think this is the funny thing is like anyone who i mention in graphics when we're doing graphics most of them are still alive so we talk about building structures and things and we talk about um oh damn why did his name just disappear from my head um, splines, a uh, catmull, Ed Catmull, uh, catmull splines, which are ways of building curves and stuff out of control points and things. And the guy still works with Pixar, right? So it's really funny. These people are still alive and still working on things. And we're going to be teaching their stuff like they're like, like Pythagoras and stuff like that. And it's like, nah, it just works in LA. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. Um, yeah. So if we, if we do this basic stuff, we'll have polygon rendering. Um, texturing, lighting, and we can do stuff like object hierarchy, and we can do transforms for animation um, and stuff like that. So the hierarchy and the transforms are important for stuff, and this is why, this is one of the reasons why um, I think the object-oriented programming course was the prereq, is like the, the idea of hierarchy is something that's really useful here. But I think also that this was done in Java, and that was a Java course, and so that, that made sense. Um, We'll see how we go but these are concepts not not languages that we're talking about here if we have all of this stuff we could remake quake one um quake one was pre-graphics cards remember this um it was running on a cpu um so we're talking like maybe i think 320 by 240 resolution until graphics cards became more prevalent and then we started using graphics acceleration with with quake one and that became kind of the first engine that went around and did other things as well um I mean, might need to teach you what a graphics engine is, even, you know? Um, are people talking about uh, exam stuff or something? It looks like Tom has been hiding... 
have hidden comments that are quotes from fast inverse square root. <laughs> okay, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. Um, Hamish is asking, could we expect to make Half-Life level graphics after this course, um, better or worse? It's difficult to say because a lot of what makes Half-Life graphics good is, um, is the art that goes into it. Um, you will be able to do a lot of the basics. Um, there's some stuff you won't be able to do, uh, I think. So if we get to this stuff post 3D. So we go to 3D stuff. We go, okay, we're in a three-dimensional world and we put stuff in that world and we look at it. And there's all this stuff going on there. So there's there's depth as in like, if something should be blocking the view of something else, then, then something else should render over it. So we maybe look at Z buffers and stuff like that. We look at culling to be like, I can only look forwards um so i can't see what's behind me so what's behind me shouldn't get put into the pipeline of things that should be shown um, and also just geometry i mean geometry maybe should be in the 90s you know but it's all it's all in in amongst the same kind of work needs to be done to learn about that and then we do shaders as well i think shaders are very important because when we do shaders we're going to learn about i think two important things the GPU and the graphics pipeline, and the GPU is a really, really weird piece of hardware, right? And we might even look at like, why is it even separate? You know, why isn't every computer just just have two chips on it? And you look at your laptops and stuff, and they're just, they're, they're two chips on one motherboard, right? But our desktop machines have them completely separate because they're made by different people. Uh, I mean, I know under the surface they're made by the same people. <laughs> There's like one factory in Taiwan making everything. <laughs> but um they're very very different so what we think about processes and how processes work is completely different with graphics cards so maybe we need to think about that and then when we think about that and understand it then we can write shaders because shaders are going to do a very very different thing than our normal code um and maybe if i can get us into this soon enough then we the language we'll be using is one called glsl is OpenGL shader language, uh, which is different from whatever programming language we're using. So maybe what I can do is I can just give people the code, um, which is in the normal language and go, we're not worried about that code. What we're worried about is like the deeper stuff, or we're worried about just modifying that code so it works. So it doesn't matter whether you know the language or not. I don't know whether I can get us to that point or not. We'll see. Um, the stuff that gets really, really cool though, um, is, um, Still looks the same. Have I seen the vid about the TF2 dev slowly going insane and seen through the comments? <laughs> I think, like, you, you watch it, their Git repo as they get closer to release and, like, just losing it. Yeah. Um, oh, Jennifer's saying subtly points the video specifically about liquid shaders in Half-Life Alec. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And I actually also want to... Um, Oh, Izzy's asking how close would this be able to get to make shader packs and mods in Minecraft. I don't know what the shader packs are in Minecraft, um, but if they're ways of rendering different things, I think this would definitely get you there, but I don't know. It's because I don't know exactly what the, the shader packs are. Anyway. So after we've gotten all of this stuff where it's like we can make stuff appear on screen, then we get to stuff, the really interesting stuff where people started doing stuff where like, okay, after you've decided what color all the pixels are, can you change them all? So something as simple as like just going over the whole thing and making it black and white. It's like, oh, that, that, that shouldn't be that hard, right? You sample from the RGB and you take the average and then you, you do that. But you go, oh, okay, what's, what's some cooler stuff we can do? Um, we could blur an entire screen by not just sampling from the pixel we were looking at, but sampling from the pixels around them. Um, and then we get really, really deep once we go further into post-processing and we go, what about um, lighting algorithms that will be in here are really, really expensive. Because you've got to look at the light, you've got to look at this 3D world, see where the light hits, and then um, see how it bounces off towards the camera and then decide how bright it should be in the mix of colors between the surface color and the, the the light and you've got to do that for all these positions in the scene and stuff like that um there's a way of doing lighting where you don't even do it like that what you do is you do lighting in screen space based on what's actually visible to the camera and each light having an area of effect which is actually just another 
polyg polygonal shape. This is something that's not really worth talking about now because you need all the background to be able to understand it. That was my goal. I said, can I get people to that level? And then I'll be like, that is graphics. And that takes you to basically the present day if we ignore the fact that ray tracing is starting to become a thing. Real-time ray tracing is beco becoming a thing. Um, this would get you nearly... I mean, like, it won't be great coverage, but these are three things, and I only have two phases to teach. So I think it's probably going to be these two, and then one lecture on all this stuff, talking about how cool it is, and then you can look it up yourself. Maybe? We'll see. When I start assigning topics to, to lectures and time, I, I will see how much of this actually happens. There's... <coughs> There's huge gaps in here as well. There's, there's huge gaps. Um, should we be talking about procedural generation? Uh, should we be talking about um, uh, curves? And should we t be talking about modeling? Like, as in, should we be talking about the creation of 3D models um, and why that's important? Uh, and, you know, the, the creation of 3D models should be another entire course on its own. And it should be a course taught to digital artists, not to um, not to programmers. So that's a weird thing. It's like, do I include that in the course just so that people know about it, or do I just go, this is how you import something that someone else has already created, and then I'll grab some stuff off like ArtStation, whatever, not ArtStation, Turbo Squid or something to just like throw in there for you for you to use or something like that. I don't know. We'll see how we go. Okay. <laughs> So, what are we talking about in chat? We're talking about liquid shaders. This is really interesting, like, um, talking about fluids and stuff like that. Valve did a lot of work on fluids for Portal. Yeah. Hi, Joanna. Don't worry. People were laughing at me for spending an hour and a half on the first slide because I didn't actually... Um, what's my call? I didn't actually start talking about this stuff until, I think, an hour and a half in. Um, Jennifer's saying feels like topics to touch on like how you touch on history stuff in 1511 lectures you could point towards other UNSW courses yeah I think that's a good idea I think I should just stick to the things that you definitely need in order to be like a graphics engine programmer and then everything else that's around that we'll, we'll just sort of um, we'll still talk about in lectures it'll be like okay this lecture's not implementable content uh and this lecture is and, and that kind of stuff so yeah like let's 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 like now that i've kind of broken this thing down into like this stuff thinking about how we're actually like what are we actually learning like i have to step back for a second and go what are we doing we're tricking human vision so why why is this watery ball <laughs> sitting in our head working with what we do on screen so what can we do on screen to trick this thing into believing things and it's really interesting because um like what we're doing is we're doing this whole thing of like frames frames per second and stuff like that we're talking about well, like, well what, what even are they you know maybe we need to talk about the idea of, like what is modern animation in a sense like because like this didn't start until I don't know. I don't know when the the earliest example of the uh, what do they call them zoetropes? I think of like a whole series of little like figurines in different portions of movement spinning, and a light above it that flashes on and off, and so you see different images of things. Um, and we look at early film, and we're we're, we're looking at like this thing's only been around for like a hundred years. Like everything before that, human vision was about looking at actual things looking at the real world and how it moves and stuff like that whereas when we're looking at a screen what we're looking at is a sequence of still images that are close enough to each other that our mind interpolates the difference uh, likewise with color the only reason why color makes sense to us is there's a certain form of electromagnetic radiation that our eyes are made to to work with and the reason why we have red green blue colors in each of our pixels is they correspond nearly directly to the physical things the the light receptors in our eyes basically as close as we can make it um one of the types of receptors goes off with red another one goes off with green and another one goes off with blue 
and then we set those off with those specific pixel colors and they match. Um, and so if we do different variations of those pixel colors, we will perceive things differently. But the reason why we have that three part color thing in our monitors is as we have a literal three part color receptor in our eyes. So there's nothing kind of fundamenti fundamentally like axiomatic of the universe of the physics of, um, of electromagnetic waves or anything that makes RGB the colors we use on screens. It's entirely based on us as humans. I'm basically giving you the first lecture now. This is this is gonna be the first lecture. <laughs> like that's 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 what I want to talk about because that's all it is. It's it's all an illusion. It's all a trick, right? I mean, obviously it is. Like if we can see our screens, we know that they're not physically real, but we're gonna believe certain things in them anyway. So yeah, frames per second. I I always used to make this 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 thing when I used to say to people, it's like what are your favorite games and stuff? People talk about their games and things. Um, and then I would say to them, what would you say to me if I told you that in your, in every game that you've ever played, nothing has ever moved. Nothing has ever moved, ever, in any game you've played. Don't care what it is, nothing's ever moved. And people are like, what do you mean? And it's like, there's, there's always stuff moving. There's stuff moving everywhere. Even in, like, non-real-time games, turn-based games, this stuff moves. It's like, no, nothing has ever moved. And people are like, oh, you, what are you doing? And, like, the people who know me a bit are like, obviously, he's leading to something. There has to be something going here. And then I teach them about animation. It's like 60, like, well, 24, 60, 144 still images per second. Um, things in games teleport between positions in each of those frames they do not slide gracefully across from one position to another they simply are teleported by our system between those positions and they've never moved they're absolutely still in each of those positions and and it's like oh and people are like whoa but i mean yes but yeah and it's like and it and you need to you need to get to that point you need to get to that point where it's like this has all been a trick right none of this is real and then when we get around to that, we go, okay, if the entirety of computer graphics, the entirety of everything we're doing with real time and animation and everything like that is just a trick to get people to believe things, then you start to get in the mindset of a graphics programmer because nothing that you're doing should be a reflection of real life. It should be a trick to appear like it's a reflection of real life. Most of our lighting algorithms simply do not obey physics. They do not obey the physics of light at all. What they do is they say, when you're not looking clearly at this thing, you're gonna believe it anyway. Um, most of our lighting algorithms do that. They're like, people think it's shinier if it has these like little white highlights on it, like it's reflecting a light. And it's like, is that what the light looks like? So like, no, the light doesn't exist. It's like, so if the light doesn't exist, we're making it reflect something. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, how does that work? And it's like, works with this weird maths. And it's like, why is that weird mass like that? And it's like, I don't know. It just runs fast. It runs fast and it tricks people. And you're like, what? And that's it. That's it. That's all the lighting. <laughs> like pretty much all the lighting in computer games. None of it follows physics. It's just like, oh, if we just calculate all the angles, it should be brighter if the angles are like this. And it should be dimmer if the angles are like this. It's like, what do you mean should be? And it's like, yeah, well, like people have accepted it. So we just kept going. And it's like, oh, shit, really? <laughs> and it's like, that is, that is lighting in games. Because it's like, if I told you you've got a one hundredth of a second to get this thing going and it needs to look realistic, it's like, oh, okay then. That's, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just going to see what people are talking about. Yeah, people talking about filters for cameras being for human eyes. Yeah, it looks the same. It's like saying nothing ever actually touches. Um, yeah, so it is. It's really a trick question, but it's a trick question. And you you know, like anyone who's been my student before knows that I will do stuff like this. Um, I'll do stuff like this where you kind of know. If you know the trick, you know. Um, but whether you know the trick or not, the, the point is not really to, to pick at whether, um, uh, whether what I'm saying is correct or not, but to think about um, the where the world I'm trying to take you to. The world I'm trying to take you to is a world of like, like I'm I'm, I'm thinking like, eighteen hundreds theater, smoke and mirrors, um, 
people popping out of trapdoors with smoke in front of them and no one realizing that the trapdoor existed. And what I'm saying is like, this is the, the, the point of graphics. The point of graphics is to trick people into believing something. And if they believe it, then they're all in. And that doesn't mean it has to look real, right? So the whole history of computer graphics is not about making things look real. It's making, about people believing that the world exists. And it's just like storytelling. If you tell people about a world full of uh, dragons and elves and dwarves and stuff like that, and people are like, well, that obviously doesn't exist, but I'm in. I'm in. This world's got its own consistency. Um, it may have its own rules and stuff, and I will follow, you know? And you can do that with graphics as well. It doesn't have to be physically correct. It just has to has to take people in, and they will believe it. I mean, you take something like Team Fortress 2. People were talking about Team Fortress 2 before. It's, like, super interesting, right? Because Team Fortress 2 has weird, weird inconsistencies in its graphic style. Like, the characters are all um, uh, cel-shaded, comic-lined characters. They're not fully comic-lined, because they've got no cross-hatching or anything like that, but they've got outlines, um, and they've got two-tone shading, that kind of thing. Uh, the environments don't the environments are painted so they're completely different but we just still believe it you know um and we're still in there and we still like we still we still take it as a given that this is how this is going to work and how it plays and it's like oh okay i guess i guess we're okay with it and and i think it's because where you need consistency there's consistency where you need identifiability there's identifiability every single one of those characters if you can't see anything of the character you black out everything you can still tell who they are by their silhouette so we're in we're in and we're involved and sometimes the buy-in is more important than the quality of it you get some games that have really really high quality graphics um they look look they make they look stunning they look amazing and stuff like that but the buy-in doesn't happen in the same way um people see things that take them out of the world um and then it didn't matter how good your coding was with your graphics um because the world wasn't believable and so i don't know i can't even teach that right because what can you do with code that that um, proves that you can understand that lesson? It's like I was thinking of the examples like cyberpunk, right? When you the world is n so nearly believable uh, until you see eight people on the sidewalk who are exactly the same and clones of each other, and you're just like, what? And then you're you're taken out of the imagination, and the trick has failed, you know? Or maybe that was a coding problem, um, but. You know, there's other things like that. Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda was like one of my favorite games to beat up on, um, where they were um, they had animations going wrong in cutscenes, and cutscenes are like you know this this point of the game where you don't even have control anymore, and you believe them to be this higher quality kind of movie cinematic sort of thing, and they had people whose arms were like doing physics jangles around their armor and stuff during a scene where they're trying to have a serious conversation and it was like oh no and that's it you're out you're not in this spaceship you're not in this fantasy world anymore suddenly you're back in your own room and you're looking at your computer and you're looking at like the screen and you go i'm not there and that's the worst thing that we could ever do you know and so graphics program is about that it's about bringing people into this world and keeping them there and if we if we write bad code that allows those glitches to happen and stuff like that then that's we, we've taken the story away from people and that's like the worst thing that you can do right it's like spoiling game of thrones everyone dies <laughs> yeah <laughs> shiitake is like i thought we had kind of had cutscenes figured out until that they totally did as well. Like, three months after launch, um, the cutscenes were all fine. The game was passable. It was like one of those, you know, like, 8 out of 10 games that people are like, you can play this if you want. It wasn't like the earlier Mass Effects were like, if you haven't played this, then, like, you're, you're missing out on one of the moments of computer gaming. By the way, new version of that coming out in a few days, I think? Yeah. <laughs> imagine putting spoilers in lab exercises i don't know if anyone has pl has done this is one particular question in um in 1511 which is the game of chairs where i um i had you sneakily implement a ring buffer with a link list um i don't know if anyone remembers that question but it literally has some spoilers for game of thrones in it but I figured it was, like, years afterwards, and if you didn't look at it that closely, you'd probably not notice that there are spoilers. Yeah. 
Um, so Lux is going back to Half Life, and yeah, playing through the cutscenes. There's the intro to Half Life Two, where you walk through, and you see like all the the police and the train station and all this kind of stuff. That has been pulled apart as a game design thing about immersive storytelling and stuff where the, nothing is told to you explicitly you don't have stuff saying at this point in time in the universe humans have done this and there are aliens and stuff. they don't do any of that they just drop you into the world and they force you to see it and you see it you really do see it like there's this point where you're just walking through this train station you know that there's a problem there's fences everywhere there's rubbish everywhere there is an alien sweeping up rubbish and immediately you know so much about what's going on in the world. There's an alien sweeping up rubbish? That means that there are aliens, which is like revolutionary. We have oppressed them. Like what kind of world are we in where that happened? You know, and bam, it's, that's why it's so brilliant. And there's no shooting. There's no fighting, there's no shooting in that first level. You're just walking. But you're, 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 you're wrapped in it. And there's, like, propaganda films in the train station and stuff like that. And, like, and the, the cops are all faceless under masks with these voice things and stuff. And so it's obviously, like, the, 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 the security forces are there are made to terrorize the population. The population is under control. And it's like, oh, it's just... That's all it is, you know? And it's, like, two minutes of you walking through a train station but you know where you are, then it places you in a world. That's a scene as good as the start of any good movie, you know? Like, a really good movie will place you like that in the beginning. Um, and, and, it's, and it's interesting, because, like, you know, we've got a lot to learn from movies. Movies have had a lot more time to, to create content than games have. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Back to the slides. Um... Yeah, so it looks like pick up that can. Now put it in the trash can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the City 17 stuff, like, all of that stuff, I think, is like... We were just talking about, like... And this is a different course. And I kind of want to do this, but, like, I don't have... I just don't have the time, and I don't have the... I don't have the time nor the energy to do this, but there, there used to be a game design course in CSE. Um, but there hasn't been anyone qualified to teach it for quite some time because you haven't had a gamer as a lecturer since um, a friend of mine, Malcolm, left years ago. He, he left because I think he was given the, the opportunity to run the games program at Macquarie Uni. So he took that, um, took that chance. And he used to run this thing called Game Design Workshop. Um, and I would kind of be keen to run that again, but I don't think... Um, I'm just like, how, how overstretched do I want to be like how how much do I want to end up in a position where like I just can't I can't remember what's going on with anything because I'm trying to teach too many courses at once and stuff like that so there are other lecturers who are doing it but I don't um uh at the moment I don't think I can handle that um <laughs> so looks like can, can recite every um yeah, every part of it. Henry said, please don't spoil it. Okay, well, let's not talk about any details, but just like, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much good stuff in, in Half-Life. Anyway, anyway. So, yeah. There's this funny thing where it's like, it's all a trick. It's not about physics. I think we've finished Stray Kids now. I'm just going to let it keep going. This is going to go into random K-pop now. Um, sounds like Sunmi. Whereas it is on me, yeah. Anyway, so the other things that we can talk about is like, yeah, what I said, what even is a graphics card and, and what does a graphics pipeline do? Like, how do we take a pixel from we don't know what it is through we can tell what we can see and we can tell what color it is, we can tell how it's being lit and then that pixel end up, ends up on the screen. Um, and all the little things that we can do. I mean, I could also talk about physics. Like physics modeling in in games and stuff but it's not even graphics i mean eventually it's graphics but we're definitely not gonna have time for that it's not even in my slides i just thought of it then and i thought no i can't fit that let's not even bother um yeah <laughs> so this is like just gushing about half-life fair enough i think half-life was revolutionary 
But then again, there's also, this is another thing I was thinking of, is like cool ideas. So, um, what I wanted to do was like every week, or, or even every lecture, if I can find enough things, that'll be 18 different things, is like, here's the thing we're learning about, but here's the thing that made that thing happen. So, is there something that was the pivotal moment in, in games or movies or something like that where something really happened. I've got two examples here of two of the biggest things um, that happened in computer graphics, I think, in the last sort of... Are we talking 30 years now? Yeah. So I think Quake was very, very important because it was the first sort of... I don't want to say it was the first, but, like, it was genuinely 3D, the Doom wasn't. Um... But it was definitely the game that made polygon rendering happen worldwide, you know? And it was, it was very important for what it did and the effect that it had. And I want people to know about those things in the same way that I was talking about people like Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing in 1511. Like, even if you kind of forget that, I want you to recognize those names if they come up again. Um, and there are more people, there are way more people than that, but, you know... I don't know heaps of them either. <laughs> I'm not that good with history. Um, but when it's computer games, I'm much better with the history. <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky, because I've lived through the majority of it. Um, so, you know, there's only a few gaming consoles that were around before I was born, so I get to, I get to have been... I get to have seen these things. Like, I saw Quake, and... I went from computers not having graphics cards to having graphics cards, and so I knew what happened when that happened. So I think this would be really cool, and I think this is one of those things where you go, none of this is like relevant. Well, I mean, it's super relevant, but it's not It's not exactly specifically relevant to the technical understanding of how to do uh, graphics programming. Um, but I think this is very, very important for us to know that like these things all had a context. These all had a reason for existing, and they were used in these particular ways. And these might not all be the, um, the games that were the pioneers of these things, but they'll be the things that made the most use of it um, in a popular way to, to you know, kind of hit that, allow that technology to hit its stride. Like, the first game with deferred rendering was, like, a weird Shrek game that I don't really know anything about. But when we go further than that, we go into, like, the Grand Theft Auto series and deferred rendering, and then we see, like how many lights were in a scene whereas previously based on like the lighting algorithms we'd been using previously we would have like um you know a maximum of eight lights in a scene and how are you going to do a nighttime street with eight lights you know there should be lights coming out of windows there should be lights coming out of all the cars there should be um street lights you know all of those things should be lit up and if you only have eight lights you can never really make that work Whereas, in GTA 4, it's not definitely not the first deferred rendering game, but that was one of those games where it was just like, there's like 80 lights in this scene and we can do it, you know? I don't, I don't think that was the first. I'll have to look this up, right? Obviously, I've only put like question marks around Quake and Toy Story. It's like, what am I going to talk about with Toy Story? Because Toy Story was like the beginning of the um, CG animated movies, like the crossover from the, um, the cell animation of Disney to Pixar, which became Disney anyway, <laughs> eventually, because <laughs> Disney bought everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks as like you're just going to drop the Shrek game on us and move on. <laughs> what, was that Shrek game amazing? I don't even know. Um, I know that it existed and it was the first thing with, um, uh, with deferred rendering, but I never played it and I don't, I don't know how... I know its significance historically in that it was the first commercial release with deferred rendering in it, but I don't think it was the first game with deferred rendering that was like really, really big and, and actually really made it. Yeah, Shitake is saying yes, Shrek on the Xbox is the first game to do deferred rendering, but um, don't know if it was great or not, and I haven't played it, so... I don't know how historically significant it is. I mean, this this is stuff I have to research. Like, this is this is the stuff I'll be doing um, in term two to make sure that the inspiration that I give you for each of these techniques that I show you actually makes sense. Um, 
I do know the one for bump mapping though. The Matrox graphics card was the first thing to do multiple different textures on one surface, and that was the beginning of bump mapping, where you could have one texture for color and one texture for normals. Normals are the direction that light bounces off a surface. Um, and there was a game called Slave Zero that shipped with the Matrox card. That was the first piece of hardware that did that. And, and so that's one. And I only remember that because I personally got that one. Um, but there's, you yeah, know, there's other things. Um, and it'll be interesting to see. And then there's, there's the other things that are completely different. Like Street Fighter 2 is, is super iconic for um, predating the 3D animation thing. But being able to do a whole bunch of 2D animation happening at once. And I don't know if we'll even talk about that, right? Because it's not really part of what we're coding because it's sprite-based animation. Sprite-based animation is just to take still pictures of things and just swap in different pictures. And so you can have a running cycle of someone running where each picture is a different phase of their legs. And if you swap them over each other... Um, in the right timing then you get animation um, and that's very much like kind of what the screen does at the end um, but doing that per um, per character and per background image and stuff like that but like I don't think we'll even get into that um, because if we wanted to do specifically 2D stuff it would be a completely different course um, we're going to do enough 2D stuff to have an understanding and then kind of launch straight into 3D I think that's another thing where I think I'm going to end up different from the previous course because the previous course taught you a whole bunch of theory and graphic stuff in 2D for the first half of the course and then goes into 3D in the second half. I'll see, I may end up having to do that because it might be a good idea if it's been done before. Always have to, I always have to check. Um, it's not always the best idea to think that you can just build everything from scratch and it's going to be new and different and stuff. New and different doesn't always work. Thanks, Cyberpunk. <laughs> I, just, I just... I feel bad. I feel bad beating up on that game. But it's just such an easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Um... Sinio, Mark's paper on Shrek game incoming. <laughs> the last... So look at saying, the last game on the GameCube was a Frogger game with a story mode for some reason. The GameCube nearly killed Nintendo, which is deeply ironic because it had some really amazing games on it. It was like the Sega Dreamcast was the greatest console that no one ever bought. It was like a really good console, really good exclusive games and stuff. It just wasn't marketed right and then Sega went down. It's a bit sad. Anyway, not to turn this into my talk on, on games. <laughs> Maybe I should give that talk again because the whole new generation of people here might want to see it. Anyway, okay, so this is kind of fun. I used to do this when, we, um, when I was teaching games is I would show a trailer for a game and then we'd look at the trailer for the game and then we'd go back through the trailer and go pause the trailer at different points and say, what's happening here? What's happening here? How do they code this? Like what technique is going on here? And people are like, well, I guess it could be this or this and stuff. And so we don't even know, right? But it's, it's interesting to see what's happening and stuff. And it's like, ooh, are we getting mocap there? Or is that mapping to the environment too well? Is that... Is that animation based on um, contact points in the environment? Or is it a mocapped thing that will just be repeated and it's ignoring the environment and stuff? It's like little things like that. You look at it and you go, oh, let's analyze this. You know, how are these, these lighting effects happening? Is that an emissive thing or are we looking at a screen space thing? You know, it's just interesting stuff like that. <laughs> so looks is like talking about the Nintendo releases. I think it's very, very interesting when you look at the um, Nintendo's approach to consoles is they've realized that the hardware arms race that um, PlayStation and Xbox is in is completely irrelevant to whether people will enjoy games or not. So the, the chip inside the Switch is a, a, a Nokia phone processor basically it's really really low powered compared to like a gaming pc or a playstation or an xbox and it's completely irrelevant how much processing power that thing has um because it's portable it's easy to use um it's got a whole bunch of interesting games on it um it has a touch screen 
as well and that's what makes it good um the companies caught up in the arms race don't realize that entertaining people does not require processing power there's a minimum amount of processing power you want uh and beyond that it's completely unnecessary so it's interesting because we talk about we were joking before about rtx 380 3080s and stuff like that mine's still only a 3060 3060 ti in here but that's, that's quite good still expensive <laughs> um but none of that is necessary to get people involved in a game so there's always going to be this back and forth especially when we're talking about a graphics course we're talking about graphics right we're talking about making good graphics and we talk about that we want to, we want good hardware for that but we're talking about entertaining people it's a completely different thing and then again there's this back and forth right to make stuff look interesting is not the same as um like doing massive massive parallel processing of heaps of pixels to make stuff look like hyper realistic or whatever you know anyway so yeah, we've got some cool ideas for this. Hopefully that will work. And so what goes next is like, I need to look at these things. So I need to actually um, look at the time frame, look at the topics and go, what can I fit in that time frame? Um, I need to talk to Rob and get his thoughts about how it went last time and if there's anything he would change. If he was in the situation that I'm in now where you can completely change the whole thing what would he do and he's gonna be like oh rewrite this thing this is this to this thing totally doesn't work these things actually work quite well already you should use these and I'll be like great you know and so like I could probably have a chance like I haven't actually contacted him yet but I'll have a chance to talk to him and say okay this is what um this is what he thinks from a teaching perspective I can talk to some other people. I've got some contacts, obviously, in the games industry and stuff like that. And so I'll, I'll talk to them and go, hey, if you were going to hire someone to be a, um, a games programmer, um, specifically on the graphics side of things, what do you think that they need? Like, do you reckon they need, like, a theoretical background and you don't care about what they can implement? Or are you looking for someone who can just, like get stuck in with a really difficult API. OpenGL is just a really difficult API. And do you want people who really understand shaders and stuff like that? And they might actually give me some, hopefully some really surprising advice. And then the whole course will take a different direction. You'll be like, no, you don't need to know any of that. What we need for you is, is a deeper understanding of these other things instead. So we'll see where that goes. Um, so yeah, the next thing is like, where do I steal material from? So what... <laughs> What can I steal from online? Do I do I want to teach this out of a textbook as well? Because if I want to do this the easy way, I can say, here is a textbook. There are no tutorials. Work your way through it. Um, if you want to, if um, if any of you... Oh, wow, wow. Sinio said, can you recommend any reading materials before this course? Yes, I can. Um, so this is the, the site that I am thinking about in terms of a potential for a work from textbook um, way of doing this. And it's called learnopengl.com. I am not, hopefully, like I'm not the first person to show you this or think about this if you're thinking about learning how to do graphics programming. Um, heaps of the stuff that I would want to teach would potentially come straight out of this. And if it's going to come straight out of this, I feel like it is rude to use these resources without, you know, piping it back. So I might, if I'm going to use this stuff for demos and tutorials and stuff, I might say, yes, there is an official textbook for this course and it's this. You don't have to buy it because you can just use this website, but if you want to, you can buy it. So you can get even get a print edition if you want. And it's not at textbook prices. They're only like 60 US dollars, they say. So it's like... It's not like, you know, some textbooks are like 250 bucks and stuff like that. It's not one of those textbooks. Um, but this is one of the things that I... Oh, I feel bad I'm running ad block. <laughs> so I'm not even giving them money for surfing here. Um, anyway. Um, the... Yeah, this goes through all of the technical side of things. And so we might get this far. There's deferred, deferred rendering there. Um, we probably won't even do all of this. I guess we could look at anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing is actually pretty easy, so, you know. Um, it's uh, anisotropic filtering that's a hard one. Anti-aliasing is a bit easier. Um, yeah, and all this basic stuff. Like, you could actually, if you wanted to, um, you want to just ace this course 
um, you could just do this whole website uh, before term three. And then when you get to term three, you'd be like, just tell me what the assignments are and I'll just do it, you know? Uh, Danny said UE4. Yeah, like, I, that's the, the thing that I am also expecting when I talk to professionals and they're going to be, and I'm going to say, like, what would you do? Because I had a friend, um, this friend's worked on, um, what did he work on most recently? Horizon Zero Dawn. And they've got a new project coming out, but, like, he can't tell me what it is. Um, but he was saying that, like, the funniest thing is, like, they look at, like, what people want to show them they want to show them their show reel and go look i made this amazing tree and he goes you know how we make trees like we drag and drop from from the tree making software you know and it's like it's so interesting how heaps of stuff that people are doing is um just cobbling together lots of tools that other people have made you allow someone else to be the specialist and when you're actually making a game you're just like no no, we're not going to make all that stuff from scratch. The things that we're going to make from scratch are the things that are really iconic to our world. The main character, the um, the costumes and the clothing that, that people are using for something like Horizon Zero Dawn, the mechanical dinosaurs and creatures and stuff. Like, super, super important for them to do those bits. Um, the normal world stuff, like water trees mountains and stuff like that you would just buy the package from someone else and just drag and drop that stuff into the world it's, like, it's really interesting and so like i think when i talk to people like them i might find out some interesting stuff about how yeah we can go through all of this you know and yeah this is cool it's cool to be able to build stuff from scratch you want some of that in a theoretical course but how much is that actually useful uh, how much is that stuff that people are actually doing so I have to balance between like what are people doing in the industry versus what is useful for learning because I can't just make this like do exactly what people are doing in industry because they're making shortcuts to make stuff work not learning the under level underlying theory of things and why you should do stuff so yeah it's interesting um Jennifer saying repeating your suggestion to talk to people who run graphics courses for art yeah totally I uh, knew <laughs> When Harsha says cry engine, I mean, we could, we could use something like, so that's another thing. Another thing if I wanted to is I could teach you some of the basics and then in the second half of the course, we could drop into um, the Unreal Engine and then we could say, okay, let's now jump from the past to the future. And we go, now that we have this engine and this engine can do all these things, um, now we're going to write shader code to connect to this engine. And so that way we won't have to bother with um, all the fiddly bits of, of, of coding, like uh, the structure of a game and stuff. And instead what we do is we drag and drop the structure of the game and we start fiddling around with lighting algorithms. We still start fiddling around with screen space effects and, um, um, and, and shaders and stuff. And we start saying, okay, one of the biggest things that we do in, in graphics is we we balance this slider between quality and performance. Performance is how many frames per second we can deliver. Uh, quality is like, how good does this thing look? And it always costs you frames per second to get better quality because better quality usually involves more complex algorithms for things. And it's like, okay, how do we optimize these things? You know? And so maybe that's something that is actually really interesting to do. And maybe it's not worth trying to build the knowledge completely from the ground up, but give you some grounding and then jump to the present day but i don't know i don't know if that all that does is leaves gaps in your knowledge so yeah you know <laughs> these are my problems um i at least have a couple of months to either solve or abandon solutions to these problems and get it there um Hey, Mish is saying, yeah, shaders are, are done with UE4's blueprint system which means that it won't even be coding with the shaders which might mean that we'd go with something like Unity instead, where Unity has you actually writing code for shaders, but then also, how important is writing code? Like, implementing the theory of things so that it works is important, and if you're doing that in, like, an old-school, like, textual programming language with curly brackets and semicolons and all that stuff, then yeah, okay. But if you're going to do it by dragging and dropping components that you understand the theory of and connecting them together with lines so that you understand which function calls which and stuff like that, is that or is that not coding? It's just coding with a different interface. So 
maybe. Again, today was not a day for answers. Um, today was a day for looking at the the rationale behind why things are the way they are and thinking about um, making sure that whatever I design fits the goals because this is the first the first of these that are going to be like a whole series of, of me talking about things so the next time I talk to you about this I don't know when it'll be maybe two weeks or three weeks or something like that I'll give you an update on how graphics is going and I'll be able to say some of these questions now have answers um, and if, once these questions have answers, I, I can say that, like, this is the concept that I'm going to teach. Um, and then this is how the subject matter backs up that concept, that kind of thing. So that's the, that's where I am right now. So as you can see right now, very few decisions have been made. I don't want to be locked into decisions. What I want to have is um, decisions I can make later but what I want to do is clarify goals first. This is, you know, pretty simple. Uh, problem solving 101 is we don't start prototyping until we understand the problem. Um, this is why if any of you do uh, this stuff like an undergrad thesis or you go on to do uh, research later, you don't, you're not really allowed to sort of start writing code for the first, like if you're doing a thesis over a year, um, you would spend the first sort of three, four months specifically not writing code you know you need to find out where you are you need to orient yourself in the space and decide what your goal is going to be because if you started writing code right away chances are you're just going to throw it all away when you figure out that um you have a goal you're trying to meet and that was not it you weren't aiming in the right direction so this is where i am now i'm trying to keep it really open and say find the direction um but you know there's a whole lot of details in here that are going to be like, if we find our direction, we're going to we're going to think differently about how we're going to do these things. We've got a whole bunch of constraints as well, so we're focusing. We're not we're not just looking wildly for a direction. We're focusing. Um, but yeah, and so you notice because like heaps of the chat has been about languages and stuff like that, and I'm just like, no, nah, not not there yet. The language is going to be a late decision um, because the educational goals come first. And many languages will likely support those educational goals. And so it'll become like the language decision will probably be something along the lines of like, um, which of these supports what I'm going to teaching in a way that people can get into it with the least amount of um, issues. Uh, and that's difficult. This is the demographic is very wide. Um, and it's easy for everyone to have an opinion on that, which is why I don't care about it. <laughs> Because I, I don't care about anyone saying about what languages we're going to use because um, that's not what I'm teaching. If I was teaching a language course, then that would be the thing on... That would be the goal. The goal is not language here. The goal is like understanding how computer graphics works. And I could teach you that without programming if we wanted to. Um, I'm not going to do that because I feel like if people are doing a computer graphics course, they want to come out of it with something they can show people. Because imagine I, I teach a computer graphics course, which is entirely theoretical. So here's the ideas and stuff, and here's the mathematics behind it and stuff. But no, we're not going to write anything. <laughs> You'd, by the end of it, you'd just be like, oh my god, I just want to make something, right? So, so it's got to it's got to have both. Again, again, why there was a slide on theory versus practice and how do we balance that? Um, uh, so, what I leave you with basically is a whole bunch of questions. Um, and a commitment to not looking for quick answers. You know what I mean? And I think this is like very much an educational perspective. And it's a perspective that I think a lot of people have is, you know, that the quick answer is always like an instinct. Um, it might be useful for you to think about later, but the quick answer often is just, is just us with our biases and us with our um um looking for the easy way to do things rather than like us going okay every decision we make must reach our goal and everything every effort we put in must must go towards the goal so what we're going to do is we're going to think very carefully about um uh where we want to end up and um and then everything kind of cascades back from that end goal 
and then we will eventually reach a point where the infrastructure has no choice but to be some, a certain thing. That's what I'm hoping for. What I'm not hoping for is I reach, I, I cascade back and the infrastructure is feasibly impossible at CSC. Uh, and then, then there has to be some kind of other discussion. So I think I should have put in the slides that I need to talk to um, CSG, the computer support group. And I say, if I'm doing a graphics course, which requires people to use graphics cards and we don't have any in any of our labs, what are the options? Um, and then I'm sure that they've got options because the course has run before. So there has to be some way that um, people figured this out in the past. So, I mean, again, you know, decisions are easier to make when you've got lots of information. Anyway, let's see what we're talking about here. People talking about, people are talking about language is lovely. <laughs> um, people are talking about Samuel saying playing around with Unreal would be cool. I think that like what we what we might do, I don't know if like people would be interested in something like that is just to do game engine stuff completely unofficially. Like that's what um, the Game Dev Society at UNSW can do. I don't know I don't know how much they do. Um, I I feel really bad because when I turned up in 2019, I said, hey, I'm here. You're the game dev society. I'm, I'm a game dev teacher. I should come along and like, you know, take part and, and do things. And then I got thrown into 1511 and I went, why do I have so many students? And then I just never went back. I feel bad. Um, and all I ended up doing was um, being able to make a connection with CSC SOC because CSC SOC was kind of more official. Um, and I didn't really didn't really reach out as much as I as much as I initially wanted to um but yeah like there could be something where like if a whole bunch of us want to learn about Unreal Engine we can just do it together and just go through demos and stuff like because Unreal Engine has a a huge incentive to teach people how to use itself um because the way they work is that you don't pay any money so you you don't pay any money for using Unreal Engine until you start making big bucks. And when you start making big bucks, then you pay a percentage to, to Epic Games. And it's just the smartest business, business model ever because it means it's free for students. So you can get people hooked in, first hit's free, and then when they're addicted to the drug, then you start charging them. It's beautiful. And also it means like they're actually supporting developers because if you make a game that only like a thousand people buy, like Among Us, <laughs> I don't think that's Unreal. I'd assume that it's Unity, but anyway, Unity is the one that people mo use more for small 2D projects like that. But anyway, when it sells like a thousand copies and no one cares about it, you're like, okay, it's fine. I didn't have to pay anything for the engine. It's good. And then when it turns into a juggernaut that takes over the world and everyone's playing it, then you pay your cut. But by then you're happy to pay your cut because you've made all that money and you're like, oh, that's cool. Like, you know, and so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty friendly business model um, in that, like, other engines, like, back in the day when you wanted to work with CryEngine, you, you drop your, like, $50,000 first, and then you start developing with CryEngine. This is like, wow. Okay, so no indie devs can do that. That's going to be um, your, your, your AAA companies. Like, AAA companies is 50 grand. That's nothing. Whatever. Let's go. Um, and... Um, the um but like your your indie company says fifty thousand dollars well i mean like i'm already living in my parents basement how how could i possibly have that if i had that much money i would rent an apartment just to begin with i would get my you know i would get other things happening so the unreal thing is like yeah have it for free pay us only if you make it and it's like this is great it's a wonderful business model uh source engine <laughs> Uh, Zach said I missed a question that you asked earlier. Yeah, potentially. Um, Jack is like, we've all ghosted societies. <laughs> yeah. I feel worse if I ghost a society just because, like, I think a lot of the student societies don't get attention from lecturers. I think a lot of the lecturers are too busy to interact with students. That's a real awkward thing to say. <laughs> The lecturers are too busy to interact with students. Isn't that their job? <laughs> I mean, interact with students outside of the courses. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Zach said the message is gone. But the question was, can you upload these slides somewhere? Asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah, I can upload these slides. I could even just change the sharing or something. I'll, I'll, I'll put it, like, maybe in a comment or a... Um, a uh, in the description of the... Um, of this uh, this stream. Tom's laughing when they're addicted to the drug they pay. Yeah. Um, totally. I mean, it's like... It's worked for drug dealers for years, so it's going to work for games as well, right? That was a recent thing on Four Corners, and I think that was actually, like, not just your average dumbass beat up about how games cause violence or something stupid like that but it was actually talking about um uh genuine issues facing gamers about um um some games being made as exploitation for people and stuff and like exploiting game addiction and things like that and it's pretty bad because a lot of us kind of enjoy our game addiction and and don't want to be exploited at the same time um so you can take your loot boxes and just shove them up anyway <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah um and that actually had some genuine input from game developers so it's not just an entirely you know like the media likes to beat things up and make them stupid i think that that um four corners report might be uh might actually be something with facts in it um i just know that because i only heard about the report from the back end not from the actual airing of the report i heard before it came out from people who had uh, contributed information to it and they were saying look this thing's coming out soon we know we're going to get edited we hope we don't get edited badly and stuff and so i know that people who actually know what they're talking about contributed to that so see if it's interesting not sure um <laughs> scary mark it's a friendly business model also mark use drugs as a metaphor hey i'm not saying that like the the the, the business model for drugs isn't friendly because it might have a very friendly business model it's just that the product itself is 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 a toxic product which could be said about a significant number of games so you know <laughs> uh, anyway <laughs> hamish was saying you've done a bunch of ue4 stuff but only blueprints since ue4 c++ is messy and i don't want to go near it i've got a friend who got, got quite deep into the ue4 c++ stuff um, and he said it's it's really kind of scary because you plug it all into Visual Studio and um, the Unreal API is so big that your autocomplete um, goes really, really slowly unless you, um, uh, uh, unless you figure out another way of using it because it's not used to trying to do autocomplete with that many API functions at once. So the library has like, I don't know how many thousand functions all available in any scope and it's like can we not do that but it doesn't and um yeah and so like he was saying that like when when you do it you you you, you tab to autocomplete and then you'd sit there and wait for like 30 seconds before the list pops up and it was like oh that's you can't you can't delve like that and the compilation also took hours um depending on how big your project was if you're hooking into too many things so yeah pretty pretty funny Zach, it's for a friend. I don't mind if it's for you or for a friend. Like, I'm, I'm happy for all this stuff to be public. Like, I'm, everything I'm saying here, even if it, like, you know, people go like that will give you an advantage in the course, and it's like, you know, what gives you an advantage in the course? Like, learning it before you get to the course. Like, that's 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 not an advantage. That's learning something. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's like, oh, I went and learned something on my own. And there happened to be a course on it. So I took the course to see if what I'd learned on my own was relevant to the course and also to learn some of the fundamental theory behind the, the random stuff I learned. There's no problem with that ever. Like, like n n never be wanting to like hold anyone back from, from wanting to find stuff out from th themselves. And everything that I'm going to say about the building the course is really to show people how interesting it can be to, to build up a university course and stuff because I think that students are interested in seeing that. But... Um, how you build a course has always been a um, behind closed doors sort of thing. And the whole point of education is like the, the, none of the doors should be closed in a sense. Like you should, you should see everything. I'm obviously not going to give you the assignment specs before the course or anything like that, but you're probably going to end up seeing a lot of the slides and a lot of the concepts as I build them up over the next couple of months. And I've got no problem with that because these aren't even my concepts. Like I've already shown you that like, if I'm going to use a textbook to 
already public information. Um, and this, I consider look like quite a valuable way to learn how to do this anyway. So like, if I wasn't teaching this course, I would send you here and go, you want to learn how to code OpenGL? Just go through this. It's not like um, I'm not going to do, be doing the same thing. Like I'm going to be going through and just do this whole thing and then um, pick out the bits that I think are good, modify them to teach the way I want to teach, and then that's what goes into the tutorials. I don't know if I'm going to have time for all of that, but I mean, like, <laughs> this stuff, it's going to take me a couple of days. I can go through the whole thing. It's not that big a deal. Um, like, that's what it means if you've done something before. If, you've, if you're going to do it the first time, you don't understand what it means, yeah, obviously it's not going to take you a couple of days. It's going to take you a few weeks, which is exactly what the 10-week course is. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I probably won't even go too deep into this stuff because I know that I'm not going to take you into that. And also, going through this will tell me whether I do want to teach this or not. You know, because I might go through this and just go, ah, oh, this stuff is like, yeah, okay, technically it makes the stuff appear on the screen, but I don't know if this is what I want to teach. Does it fit the goals? So all of this stuff, test it against the goals, decide whether it fits the goals, then it goes into the course or not. Anyway, um... What are we talking about there? Three and a half hour stream, Mark, on that streamer grind. It has been three and a half hours. Oh, okay, so we're nearly at twice the amount of time. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow down. Wait, Hamish said, how many contacts do you have? Did I show how many contacts I have at some point? I'm not sure. Um, Ada, <laughs> the stream's still going. Oh, oh, Ada's here. I can make you a mod, Ada because you work for me. Um, <laughs> Sam went and played a card game and came back. Abraham said it's not 4am yet. Um, GameStormer says Mark is a pro streamer now. Well, you know, technically I've been a pro streamer for over a year since um, uh, UNSW was forced to go online and I've been streaming for lectures for that whole time. <laughs> technically, I've been paid to stream for over a year now. Um... Oh, Zach has another inside joke that you want to build up a course. I think that'd be interesting. I think, like, when I was a PhD student, I had this, like, idea. It's like, oh, how cool to be to teach. And I actually approached my supervisor saying, hey, could I help teach something? And it was like, could we teach a course? Like, because back then I was doing my PhD on game AI. I was like, could I teach a course on game AI? And it's like, oh, maybe, but, like, it's going to take us a while to get it started and then running and stuff like that. Because game playing AI is an interesting offshoot of AI. I mean, it's really just decision making AI, but decision making AI in a hostile environment is 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 different and interesting. Um, I may end up doing something like that anyway. I actually have a whole talk on um, game theory, game theory as applied to games, rather than game theory as applied to economics. Economics is where game theory gets used a lot, um, and there's a joke that um, there's uh, um, no game theory professor has ever actually won a game using game theory which kind of is funny because game theory is sort of works um and then sort of just gets itself into weird head spaces and can't find a way around things um but anyway maybe i'll talk about that more when we start thinking about um doing writing our own game playing ais for competition and stuff like that and i will actually run the competition so that we're we're doing something interesting um with them and because i'm not i'm not going to do that as a um as just uh um just a random one-off comp i want people to learn something from it and that's probably like it might actually be a really interesting um blueprint for a course so i could do a course on game playing ai where it's like every two weeks there is a um a competition and so everyone has to write players to play in this competition. And then what I will do is at each kind of code review at the end of the competition, I will show people techniques for making AI to play games. And then that would be a course of 10 weeks. Every two weeks, you have another tournament. Um, and then you'll be... I don't know whether I could mark people based on their performance in the tournaments or not, because I've already said that I would never do that. But if I did it as like a third or fourth year course, I would totally do that, you know yeah 
Oh wow, Jennifer's saying just did Econ Econ one one oh one. Interesting, but also flashbacks. I think yeah, and Joanna's saying Prisoner's Dilemma. It's like, Prisoner's Dilemma is a hilarious one. I think Prisoner's Dilemma is really interesting because it's everywhere. Um, basically anywhere where there's a group of people who have to live together, but there's a potential for competition between them, Prisoner's Dilemma exists. I think one of the um, one of the ones someone told me once, which I found really interesting, was like, prisoner's dilemmas are just out there in the real world. Uh, fashion is a prisoner's dilemma. Um, because if you dress nice, so if, if I buy expensive clothes to dress nice, um, which, not saying anything about what I usually wear. <laughs> I do it with sneakers. I get really nice, expensive sneakers because I love them. Um, but you you get to look better than other people but if no one spend that extra money then everyone would have more money and not have to look different and stuff and not be in competition with other people for how you look um and so it's this kind of thing where if we all stopped competing we'd have more money for other things but we won't because if only one of us starts competing and everyone else doesn't compete then that person wins so we all compete just in case other people are going to compete so it's it's an interesting thing. Like little things like that just end up appearing uh, everywhere. So prisoner's dilemma turns up all over the place. Um, so what were people saying? Oh, Sonny's asking if Zach was going to run a Rust course. Uh, Jennifer wants me to do an ad for UNSW in the typical sponsor style. Hey, did you know? that I heard that if you want to learn amazing things, there's this university you can go to to learn from. And then cue video and stuff like that. And it's like, please don't click away from the video when I start speaking like this. Because <laughs> that's what everyone does. Yeah. Cineo says, sound like, kind of sounds like an arms race. And an arms race is a prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> an arms race is two countries getting into like, um, building up stuff where if neither of them built up arms both of them could spend more money on their own citizens and they'll all be happier but because one of them starts doing it the other one starts doing it the other one doesn't even have to do it if one of them thinks that the other one might do it then they start building up this stuff and it costs them both so they both lose in trying to win it's it's everywhere humanity is just like one big prisoner's dilemma it's like just we're it's like we're, we're stuck on this planet and we're slowly degrading our own habitat um, if we all chipped in together to stop degrading the habitat, then we'd all be in a very good place. Um, but if anyone doesn't chip in to help, then they'll have more resources to be able to do whatever they want with it. And so everyone's just kind of not chipping in to help, and our climate's just going downhill, and like in, in, in 20 or 30 years, we're just going to have like massive storm events and giant deserts and nowhere to grow food, and like everything's going to get worse, and it's just like... You know, it's like we all could have we all could have fixed this, you know. Except we got caught in a prisoner's dilemma and we all escalated instead. And it's like, oh, you know, everything. Everything about humanity is prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Kaiju's like, is this stream gonna go for four hours? The answer is no. This stream is not gonna go for four hours. I'm gonna go back to good old slide one. Slide one that we were here for, for so many hours on. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up here because <laughs> it's very late and I didn't actually bring enough drink to, to, to soothe the throat while I was talking. I do have, I do have someone at least. Hang on. Wait, I pressed the wrong button. What are you doing, chicken? What are you doing? I think she's just licking her paws. That's it. It's like she's having a little bath before she goes to bed. Oh, there you go. Settling in. That little chair, it's like we don't sit on this chair. It's like become her chair. I don't know if you can tell, like, the pink kind of blanket that's on it is, like, in sections kind of grey-brown because it's got so much of her hair on it. But anyway, I knew that I wouldn't be able to finish this without, um, <laughs> without at least letting you say hi to chicken once. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up there. Um, thank you all for coming along. I hope that, um, 
at least what I've shown you tonight about um, the the start of the thinking about the graphics course gives you an insight into how um, how Electra like starts putting a course together, and also um, a bit of just hanging out and chatting about K-pop and stuff like that. That was fun. Um, I'm going to leave you with something though. Um, please look after yourselves. Look after your friends. Um, I think that's very important, potentially more important than actually learning anything. I think, um, like, we have a lot of weird shit in the world about people's well-being and, and um, wellness and mindfulness and stuff like that. And I'm really kind of, like, sometimes really wary of throwing around buzzwords like that because I often find that any time there's, like, a significant number of buzzwords around something it's um it's companies fucking with people and then pretending that if they turn around afterwards and they talk about mindfulness then they actually care about people whereas the the true caring about people is not ruining their life situations in the first place you can't ruin someone's life situation and then come back and go oh you need some meditation you know that's why I'm always a bit wary when people talk about stuff like that. But I think one of the key things is that, you know, being, being in an environment where you feel, you feel safe to be able to do what you need to do to live your life, I think involves much more than um, um, occasionally thinking about uh, wellness and mindfulness. I think it's often about us supporting each other um, and us also pointing out to those things that aren't supporting us properly that they should be so you will find this because inevitably as you go around and you um, work for different companies you will see different companies do things in very different ways and you'll see some companies don't need to have specific well-being things because what they do is they don't overwork people and they value people properly and they care about people and they like create a safe environment for people to work you know so these people are like genuinely fulfilled um and then other companies will drag you over the coals um and will overwork you and pay you in awkward ways or force you to do overtime and stuff like that and then once a month they will they will bring in someone to tell you that you need to be happier you know and somehow it then becomes your fault that you weren't happy even though it's definitely the company's fault so I just want to talk about that because I think that's something that we do need to be mindful of. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to say like, also that like people who are working on that stuff, people are working to try to make lives better. I don't think that there's anything bad with that at all. Um, but I think the thing that we need to often think about is that there are, there are systems in place in our world that are making people's lives worse. Um, and that's where a lot of our problems are coming from. Anyway, <laughs> Didn't want to, uh, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't want to necessarily end it on such a, a down note, but I think it's something that, like, you know, this, the, the world we're in now, we need to think about things like that. It's kind of important. Yeah. Jack is like, yeah, love to be asked to take personal responsibility for systemic issues. Yeah. I'm, I'm really kind of like, you know, that we've got issues. This is why, like, a lot of the times when, when I'm doing stuff like, you know, putting people through an exam, I'm really, really careful about how I talk about it. I really talk about how an exam is a, is a necessary evil, and I know that it's not a good thing, but it is the situation that we're in, and we will do what we need to do, in a sense, rather than saying that, like, rather than trying to pretend that an exam might actually be good for people in any way, which it is not. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. All right. <laughs> Joanna's like, why does this feel like university in a nutshell? Yeah, exactly. And then I start talking about exactly some of the stuff that I am at least partially responsible for. And so I do have to apologize for those things, even if they're not um, entirely my fault. And then when I do have some control over those things, I do need to try to make a difference, you know? And so that's what I'm trying to do. And I think other people are trying to do similar things. So it's good. All right, let's wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Hope you have a good week. I'll see you next Monday. I don't know what I'm going to talk about next Monday. Um, but we'll see. I'll, I'll plan something during the week, and I'll put the, um, 
I'll put the video up and then we'll we'll come back next Monday and we'll do other things. So maybe I'll do some more gaming next week or something like that. All right. See you all. Have fun. <laughs>